and uh, good morning for everyone joining online. We are about to start, so please stay tuned. I think it is the time. สวัสดีครับ Good morning and welcome to breezy cold Bangkok today. We are now hosting the 2023 experts meeting. ASEAN perspectives on empowering MOOCs for sustainable lifelong learning, hosted by Thailand Cyber University Project. Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Innovation and Research. I am Dr. w a r a s u o n g d u o n g s h i n d a or Michael from s i p a t u m University, your MC and moderator for this event. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, okay, we are hosting this event in a hybrid mode. We are doing it on site. So, สวัสดีครับ everybody here. Welcome to Bangkok for international guests. And also, I don't know what time you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day to all of you who are joining us online on Zoom or watching Recording on Facebook progress. Live. I just would like to um, remind our friends online that should you have any questions or comments, please do so. You can type if you are joining Zoom. You can type your questions in Zoom chat. If you joining on Facebook. You can just simply write a comment, and we will address to your questions or to your comments. Before we start, let me um, do a housekeeping announcement. Of course, our program runs from morning nine o'clock until 4 p.m. We will start with opening remarks by the director of Thailand Cyber University Project. After that, we have the honor for having. Very distinguished speaker who gonna share with us on the overview of ASEAN qualification framework for online learning by ASEAN University Network or AUN. The executive director will kindly share his knowledge, and after that, in the morning session after the coffee break, there will be presentations on the progress and achievements on each country uh, about their MOOCs and online learning. And we will do that by alphabetical order, and I will come back to that later on. But before we start, we should welcome you all officially first. So to do that, please allow me to invite Director of Thailand Cyber University Project, Associate Professor Dr. t a p a n i t a m e t a to deliver welcome remarks. So please. Distinguished speaker and guests, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, on behalf of the Thai Cyber University Project, Office of the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation, or m e s i I would like to express my cordial welcome to each and every participant. To the 2023 expert meeting, ASEAN perspective on empowering MOOCs for sustainable lifelong learning. I appreciate an opportunity to preside physically at the meeting venue and virtual via Zoom and Facebook Live. Since the Ministry of Higher Education signed. Research and Innovation Thailand continue working to promote lifelong learning and encourage Thai people in continuing developing develop their skill and knowledge. TCU under m e s i Thailand has relied an important of MOOCs, the national digital learning platform, to promote lifelong learning for Thai people. To enable them to develop their p 
potential and knowledge. Currently, Thai MOOC work in collaboratively with the partner over 120 university and government sector in Thailand. Thai MOOC now has over 500 courses and over 1.5 million of users. The Thai MOOC platform is available to promote online education. And last year, 2022, the Thai Cyber University project, we got the reward for the innovation reward from the government, from the strategy, strategy transformation office. This, we are so proud of this, uh, this, this reward because it means that we also innovate the project for the Thai people. Before I uh, comment the meeting, I would like to add this to purpose of this meeting, which is to present the progress and achievement of each MOOC country and online education and to discuss on the ASEAN past Republic of Korea or Korea perspective on empowering MOOCs for sustainable lifelong learning. Today, we will have a chance to share current knowledge and practice on each country MOOC, the ecosystem, the transferable credential, the roadmap and progress. The most importantly, to discuss the future tense of MOOCs and come, come up with the recommendation on the direction of online education and sustainable model of MOOCs. Hence, I would like to encourage every participant to recite this opportunity and move forward together. I also would like to conclude my remarks by express my sin gratitude to all invited speakers. Dr. Sholatit Tilatiti, Executive Director of ASEAN University Network or AUN, Professor Melinda Della Prene Bandela Bandelasia or Madame Mel, our beloved friend, the Ch Chancellor and Professor, University of Philippines, Open Education, and Ex Executive Board Member, International Council for Online and Distance Education, and ICDE Ambassador for the Open Education Resources. Professor Paulina Penne, the chairman of Indonesia Cyber Education Institute, University Terbuka, Indonesia. Professor Nobinsa, Nobina at Suho, Deputy Director, Center of at one in digital and flexible learning UTM. The chairman of Malaysian Public University e-learning council or MEPITA and our supported the big supported our Korean friend Dr. Su Chu Hu, director of external affairs at the National Institute of Lifelong Learning, Republic of Korea. My appreciate also go to our Thai MOOC, the TCU and organizing committee to their effort in making this expert meeting possible. I wish the meeting a case success and looking forward to productive thing outcome. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Madam Director. And right now, it is time for all of us to hear global perspective or regional perspective. As I mentioned before, it is an absolute honor to have this distinguished person with us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have Dr. Sholajit Tiratiti, AUN Executive Director. This morning, he will kindly share with us his overview of ASEAN Qualification Framework for Online Learning by ASEAN University Network, or AUN. Okay, so without any, uh, any more delay, please join me to welcome Professor Sholajit. So, sir, now stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Michael, for the introduction. Um, uh, good morning to the, uh, the audience, both in, in the, this meeting room on site, and uh, morning to those who are in the, uh, in the Zoom links. I've been asked to uh, say something about the, the qualifications framework for online learning in, in the ASEAN region. Um, uh, to my knowledge, I, I doubt that we, are, that we already have such a framework, a proper, particularly, and tailor-made for online learning. Uh, as a regional framework, but but we do have the qualifications framework uh, as a a, a regional tools uh, uh, produced by the the ASEAN Secretariat. Uh, uh, but however, I I would like to observe that. Uh, this platform, this platform of experts, uh, together with some key universities here, present here or online, uh, got the feeling that uh, this platform is pioneering something for the, the ASEAN region and probably for ASEAN and East Asian region as well. Uh, um, which interests me a lot because uh, coming from the, the ASEAN University Network, uh, we, we, we like to work together with, with those uh, pioneers. Uh, ASEAN University Network is a kind of um, implementation machine. It is not, uh, not working on on the policy issues. I'm not working on the policy issues. I'm, I'm the CEO of the, the imp implementation body for the higher education in, in ASEAN. So this platform organized by uh, Thai Cyber University, Thai MOOCs, and, and the ministry, uh, together with all the experts here, really interest me very much. And that's something I would like to say further on, on this issue at the end of, of my, uh, my talk uh, this morning. Um, as the outline of my, my, my talk, I, I like to uh, divide it. Uh, the, the main content will be divided into three main parts. Uh, starting with a, a kind of a quick tour on the ASEAN Qualifications Reference Framework, or AQRF. It's a, a, a very quick tour because I, I trust that uh, this framework is now a, a, a very common knowledge and uh, available uh, for, for, a, for everyone widely. And then my main presentation 
will be on the the AUN's current works on on measuring and comparing learning outcomes in in Southeast Asia, which is the Erasmus Plus project. Uh, the the idea is that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, AUN is a, a kind of implementation agency. Uh, but on the one hand, we have the ASEAN Qualifications Framework, which is a kind of uh, is is come from the the top. It's a it's a top down approach. Uh, with good intention. Um, but my work is, is not the top-down approach, it's a, it's a bottom-up, it's a street-level approach that su uh, both complement and uh, supplement the, the top-down direction. Uh, so I, I would like to spend time on the main presentation on the, the AUN work. And then I will end my talk by providing some remarks on the related to the uh, recognition mechanism for online learning, uh, which I got the feeling that this platform of expert here will be the pioneer. It is not, I don't think it will come from uh, the uh, top regional body and I don't think it can come from the AUN. We, we are not the, the expert on, on this issue. So I, I look forward to, uh, to see this pioneering work. I'd um, like to start by acknowledge the source uh, the source that i i used to th this morning it come mainly from the uh, asian secretariat publications uh, particularly the publication in 2018 even though the recent publication is in 2020 and after but i found that this uh, 2018 uh, uh, guide is a, 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 a wonderful piece of work, uh, easy to understand. So, for for those, uh, uh, most of you are already familiar with the the AQRF, but for those who who would like to access a very a wonderful work on on this. Uh, reference framework, I, I would suggest uh, this publication. And also my, my main talk will be drawn from the AUN Secretariat uh, publication. Um, right, a quick tour first. The ASEAN has been working on the qualification framework uh, for, for many years. Probably uh, since I, I started to work for, for the ASEAN University Network, I already observed the, the, the ASEAN Secretariat's projects on uh, qualification reference framework. Uh, and the the end result uh, started to to show around 2015, and now uh, they are in the process of uh, doing the referencing processes. Um, as many of you already observed that. There's an objective in having this uh, common 
qualifications reference framework uh, for example is can be the uh, overarching tool to support the recognition of qualifications uh, it also be the 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 overall uh, framework to uh, develop uh, or encourage the development of uh, uh, lifelong learning uh, the, the mission that all of you here are, are committed uh, it also uh, can accommodate the non-formal education uh, but for for ASEAN itself it hope to to have this qualifications framework to be the the tool to promote uh, learn learner or student and and workers mobility in the as in the ASEAN region and and beyond. And, uh, apart from that, by having the qual qualifications framework, it facilitate our understanding about each other qualification system and for all of you here who are from the university or higher education sector the qualifications framework is aimed to promote uh, uh, the higher quali quality and of a uh, qualification system okay that, that those are the the common objective and they also come up with the approach to to enhance the, the qualifications framework at the national level also the quality of uh, qualification system uh, at, at the uh, national level uh, meaning that the regional and the, the national uh, frameworks can be aligned or, or linked up uh, that will further fa facilitate the uh, mutual understanding of each other uh, system they, they, they have a tools all the tools to to do uh, this kind of linkages uh, among the different systems in different countries in in the ASEAN region I go very fast because this is uh, already established as the common knowledge and also but the the aspect that uh, could uh, accommodate the informal and non formal learning I would say very, very much uh, fit in with uh, what what you the experts uh, are doing here uh, um, to some degree uh, uh, everything uh, boy I, I would say everything here when we talk about the qualifications framework everything just boil down to 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 only one thing or everything can be reduced to one thing only and that is the learning outcomes and this is the the heart of the matters learning outcome has been uh, an issue uh, not only in the uh, establishment of the qualification system but also in in in, in the provision of learning and teaching at the moment in the quali uh, quality assurance or QA activities in the new trends of education provision uh, such as micro-credentialing uh, and those things everything got learning outcomes at, at the heart of, of of the matters uh, 
and, and we will certainly talk about this uh, continuously, non-stop, about learning outcome. Okay, and uh, qualification framework also indicates uh, different levels of uh, education provisions in in each country and in the region. And uh, according to the the ASEAN Secretariat framework, uh, MOOCs is put in the under the. Uh, non-formal or informal education. I uh, I'm not quite certain that you would. I mean, people here, the, you are the experts. You, I'm I'm in doubt that you, that you would agree with this or not. That they put MOOCs in there. Yeah, yeah. That that's open to to I think to to the deliberation and discussions. Uh, again, I, I like to emphasize that I'm not the expert on MOOCs and online learning. The answer is live with all of you here. I, I'm not the producer of this framework either. Okay. Uh, but with learning outcome at the heart of the matters, the two domains are very important the knowledge and skills and also the application of those knowledge and skill in in the context of uh, the so called the world of work for example and the qualification framework is also the tool to to measure uh, different levels of skills knowledge and its application. So this is a very uh, common knowledge. Uh, uh, they hope that, I mean, the ASEAN Secretariat uh, uh, hope that this will finally facilitate the mutual recognition agreements leading to uh, more uh, of the workers' mobility or uh, professional mobilities in within the region uh, and hopefully beyond or at least between the ASEAN region and the our plus three uh, friends uh, Korea Japan and China right so those are just a, a quick tour uh, I like to concentrate yeah I think I got 15 minutes more. I'd like to concentrate on the current work of the, the AUN. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the qualification framework is the overarching uh, thing on top, on top of everything else when we talk about higher education. Uh, but our life, your life, your working life, I mean, your working life and mine uh, depends on something below that level. We are at the level that provide the actual uh, educational services to students. We deal with other academic uh, professors, but, but the qualification reference is above, is is on top as an umbrella. Uh, the point is, it, it matters at at the front line level that we are all in there. And again, at the heart of what we are doing. Uh, uh, and your your theme here is on online learning included at the heart of it is about the the learning outcome uh, either it's the o o online learning or on or non online learning the learning outcome is is the key 
and if we want to 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 communicate with each other to to set a certain mobility or exchange programs together or even to to talk with each other using the same educational language is about how we measure and compare our learning outcomes Th that is the the matter um, in the next few months ahead um, from I think from March from March onward uh, the AUN will spend uh, a few months doing a kind of a national workshop in seven ASEAN countries in order to disseminate how how we can do the measuring and comparing of learning outcome but the, the project is focusing on only three uh, areas one is medicine the other is the civil engineering and the third one is the teacher education. This is a, a con continuing project that we uh, started many, many years ago. And the, the, the books I brought with me today, these, these books, the online people can see as well as the on-site people. This is a product of the, the, the first wave of, of the project, which the AUN worked with our European friends. Um, but right now, we are moving to the, the second wave of the, the project, uh, which I will show you what, what it's about. But the activities are that in each country, we we're going to invite around 200 uh, universities, people. And out of 200 people, uh, 60 of them will also participate in, in the intensive workshop on, on how to do this, this thing, measuring and comparing uh, learning outcome. Um, uh, we will uh, issue the certificate. This is this is a work in progress right now. Uh, I'm, what I'm showing you today is is really fresh out of the production line of the AUN secretariat. So it's still a, a draft. I, I may change a bit something if I see that it's not beautiful enough. I can change it. Okay, the the project will talk about the processes of how we can measure and compare learning outcome using the method of the tuning academy uh, detail of which you can read or, or have a quick look in in this in this book um, and, and this year we will involve not only university but also the uh, policy makers in seven ASEAN countries. Okay, let, let me go through the, the processes, what, what we are doing. Uh, the, the, the processes uh, comprise three elements. Element number one is um, we agree, we mean the, all the pioneering team in each of the field teacher education, civil engineering and medicine, agree on the, the regional subject-specific qualifications and assessment reference frameworks. Uh, this is the, the, the main point I'm talking earlier that even though ASEAN Secretariat and our leaders issue the umbrella qualifications framework the heart of the matter is not above there it's about us yeah. 
What about each subject specific field like medicine or teacher education? How how are we going to have our own qualifications reference framework? And we do this by uh, by the assistance from our European expert. So we somehow we adapted the the, the, the European qualifications and assessment reference frameworks. And the, uh, under this first element, we do the revision of these three three books. This this three, what 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 it contains in this in in each of these these books are the uh, beta profile of the the common curriculum. The meta profiles mean uh, in each curriculum we we try to find the common elements that we all have in in the ASEAN region and also compare it with the common elements that uh, the European have in their in their curriculum as well and it will guide us as the 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 tool to derive our own curriculum design in each university um, the the tuning methodology this is a project under the tuning academy at the heart of the tuning methodology is about adaptation it's not about compliance to to any one size fit all framework this is this is the key of the tuning methodology so we learn and try to combine many components that we see fit we mean the the expert in each field or subject specific field uh, learn from each other and learn from the European and come up with the common elements we call it met meta because in each country you have a certain uh, rules and regulation you have a law governing your uh, provision of the degree programs uh, that must be accommodated when we uh, when we design our curriculum we, we have to follow or, or comply with uh, the law as well but we can also combine with the the common elements that not not only in ASEAN but also with the European half in each of the subject specific field so uh, for the second wave of this project we will revise what is in in this book as a starting point and then we develop a, a ASEAN region-wide subject specific frameworks uh, that can guide us further particularly in each country and then we, we also have a look at the desire uh, graduate profiles yes. uh, using the Kalohi this project is called Kalohi uh, reference framework uh, which is the European framework as a, as a guideline then the second element of the project is working on our our uh, subject specific experts from a selected universities they ha have been working on the student workload measurement um, this is a key uh, student workload is the key tool tool if we want to facilitate uh, a measure measurement or comparison among each uh, uh, between between the uh, curriculums from different countries need to have a common currency so to speak 
common currency one of the common currencies how in in your university how how do you measure student workload and that will play the key role in the the delivery of the curriculum So we've been through the, the use of uh, many tools, uh, uh, not only the, the survey, the, the full, full academic year survey of the actual student workload in our universities. We also use a, a logbook, a, a diary. We also have a consultation or focus group with the academic staff in order to derive the, uh, the, the, the actual uh, student workload that each study program in our uh, selected university actually uh, implement. Um, part of the Tuning Academy is to emphasize a, a, a very empirical data. It's not about when when we work below the level of framework, or if we want to introduce a new mechanism to facilitate the mobility of students. Uh, we cannot work in the abstract anymore. We need to have the the real empirical data and part of this is uh, we must be able to tell exactly how our students are working in one week uh, this is the second element and i would like to inform you also that the this project is very really tough some of our selected universities cannot continue. This is about nudging people, changing people to have a very scientific culture in managing the curriculum, managing the delivery of teaching and learning. You, you cannot just go into the classroom with the perspective of the teacher center anymore. When when the heart of the matter is about learning outcomes. It's not about the uh, a chunk of knowledge that the professors want to put into students' head. So some of our study, selected study program to pioneer this project, they sadly they have to withdraw to withdraw from the project because this is a tough uh, project implementation regime. Even tougher if you see the, the third element in the processes, which is the authentic assessment of program learning outcome. Um, uh, this is to go beyond the, the ordinary assessment of learning outcome that we already deliver in our classroom. Authentic assessment go a bit beyond by, by measuring what the student could really perform beyond classroom in the real life situation. In the, for example, in the simulated work, real work environment. And it's not about professor assessing student anymore. It must involve, for example, employers as assess students, S uh, students assessing their peers, for example. There are many, many methods that we have been uh, learned and experimented under this authentic assessment of uh, program learning outcomes in, in three fields, medicine, teacher education, and civil engineering. Um, 
this is quite quite tough as well. Um, but anyway, we went through these tough processes, and now we are, as I mentioned earlier, we are about to start. Uh, to disseminate, advertise what we have done so far in seven ASEAN countries in the next six months. Right. The, uh, what we uh, come up with, we involve, uh, uh, as you can, can imagine, we involve uh, students, faculty, also non-academic staff in our universities. And, and naturally, we involve the universities directly. Uh, the, this is just to, to show you the, uh, the, the develop, development circle of the tuning Tuning Academy that, that we apply to, to this project. Uh, um, for all these details, I will ask my uh, Secretariat office to, to send it to you. I, think it, I imagine that it should be very much interesting. Uh, and I also uh, invite you all to participate. The, the way to participate, we will accommodate both those who can, who can attend in person, and those who want to attend in online. Okay. So, stay tuned. Yeah, there will be more to come. Um, I, I hope I, I have been outlining what the AUN has been doing in this regard. Uh, quite, quite okay to a certain extent. To, to sum up, to, to sum up in an easy way, I, I would say that the AUN Secretariat has been working with the Tuning Academy probably around 10 years now in, in two waves. Now we are in the second wave. The first wave is to, to have a look and compare how we design the curriculum in these three subject area. And from those curriculum comparison, I mean, I'm, I'm boiling down to a very simple terms. From, from the curriculum comparison, how we, we could derive a very common element in each of the subject-specific field. Uh, that's the end of the first wave, which end a few years before the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we started the second wave, which is more to the how we can implement this in real terms, meaning that on the ground, at the front line, d deliver to students how we can do it. And in order to do it, we went through the three processes. Yes, we refined the curriculum meta profile. We work on the tools that call student workload measurement. And then we introduce, tested, experimented with the so-called authentic assessment of the learning outcome. At the program level, meaning that it's being tested at the subject area, at the course itself, at each course itself. It is not hanging above the curriculum anymore when you want to implement something in the university, it must go directly to the, to the courses delivered to students. So, and now we got uh, some results. And this year, 
we will disseminate these results, including we will train 60, 60 university people on how to use these tools. 60 out of uh, 20, uh, out of 200 participants that we would like to, to invite. And it also will be an open call as well. All of you will be invited as well if you can spare your time to take a look at, at this kind of movement. Uh, my main point is that uh, perhaps you can adapt something here to your online endeavor and MOOCs that you try, try to do here. Okay, so this brought me to my final part, which is to to make some remarks on the recognition mechanisms for online learning. Again, I emphasize always that I'm, I'm not the expert, you are the experts. So this is a kind of a conversation more than the presentation. Uh, starting with, uh, with the first point that um, the AUN, especially AUN QA or quality assurance, always focus on enhancement. And even though we, we work with uh, our European partners on the curriculum design project, we, we also emphasize on enhancement, not, not compliance. But as I mentioned earlier, we are not ignoring a certain set of rules and laws of the country that govern the uh, delivery of higher education. But we, we combine and emphasize more on the enhancement. So, what, whatever uh, recognition mechanisms for online learning that you would come up with, uh, I, I like to propose that the focus should always be on enhancement, not com compliance. Com compliance is easy to do. You set certain rules, uh, people got to follow but it worked against what we mentioned earlier. It worked against how we really deliver learning outcomes that could match what the world of work require from our graduates or from our learners. My second remarks is on uh, the, 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 the better approach is to work together, like the platform that you are having here, that, that, that is really admirable. That by, by working together with key providers, I observe that uh, some of the institutions here are the key provider of the, the online learning, the, the MOOCs, the, the MOOCs king and queen of the country, so-called. The, from, the, from the Philippines, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, uh, and, and the, the, the main MOOCs, probably the sole provider of MOOCs in Thailand, also here. So the approach to work together would uh, uh, would do a, a very a workable result. Uh, that, that is what I always use in the work of the AUN. Uh, but we also consult uh, beyond the, uh, the universities. We, uh, uh, we could say we, we consult with multi-sector stakeholders. Uh, consult with the employers, for example. And then my further remarks would be uh, 
that you could take advantage of your own strength. You have a certain strength, and also trends of trends. For example, the 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 learners' behaviors nowadays have changed a lot. They they're very fond of. Uh, uh, everyone is fond of uh, uh, using uh, a gadget or a cell phone to learn something from. Uh, this is the trend that you can take advantage of, and also the opportunities, such as people now realize from the COVID-19 experience that. Uh, 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 Online learning is not an option; <laughs> it's it's a must. It's one of the elements that that learners need need to use. So these are the all the the thing that you can take advantage of. And lastly, I would say this is my last slide, by, by the way. Um, we we also should be aware of the the context. Particularly, what what doesn't work. Uh, for example, I learned recently that because I, I've been puzzling uh, with with the problem on I, I uh, my entire career with the ASEAN University Network, I I fail one thing. I fail to persuade the university professor to produce some. Uh, some uh, on online modules. I work with a, a cyber university project with the Korean, for example. They, we all work there, but I I always fail to persuade uh, our professors to produce the module. But but somehow last year I found out that one of the reason is that it de it it depends on the. The theme, the subject matter of the thing you want to produce. Uh, many professors are uncomfortable to 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 produce the module, particularly on on the topic that that change that change frequently. They they don't want to put their word into uh, the module. Uh, it, it would be like uh, uh, writing something on the stone. It would be there, and that frighten our professors. Another factor is that uh, some professors are not certain about their their ability to deliver. <laughs> so there there are many factors, but all in all, I I always fail to do this. So somehow. If you want to go about this, please analyze what doesn't work and why. Thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Cholachit, the AUN Executive Director. We learned a lot from his talk. I wish that we would have much more time for him. We learned that uh, based on the model NQF, perhaps MOOCs not yet being recognized across educational levels. As a MOOC person, I would disagree. <laughs> I would say right now we can utilize MOOCs for perhaps uh, higher education, vocational education, and perhaps even uh, K-12. I think we have seen some concrete evidence um, so far, but still that is a very interesting model. We learned that perhaps when we're talking about framework, we may feel that people try to frame us to something, but rather after uh, listening to him, we understand that the framework should enhance what we currently doing in the right way. We learned that throughout his experience, there are some struggling uh, process. For example, he could not persuade some professor to deliver online module. We hope that MOOC can help overcome that problem. And perhaps next year, this time, we will come back to listen to him on success story. So without um, 
Any delay, please join me to give him a big thank. Thank you. And uh, I think we still have time for maybe one or two questions. Should there be any any comments or any questions uh, from the floor, please? Okay, uh, Madam Chancellor, uh, one moment. Um, sir, uh, good morning, and uh, thank you very much for that very enlightening uh, talk, especially your uh, last comment on the rec uh, how, how we can have this uh, recognition of the credits uh, earned uh, through MOOC. So I'm just wondering, because we've been struggling uh, in this uh, particular concern, would AUN consider integrating it in the QA framework uh, online learning? Um, r right now, what we're doing at the university, uh, Open University in the Philippines, is to look for um, proxy indicators. So I have my faculty members uh, trained uh, for the AUN uh, frame, uh, framework, QA framework, etc. So we, I, I, we've been sending faculty, but uh, with the marching order that uh, uh, in, in studying the AUN QA framework, look for possible indicators uh, because it's not exactly 100% fit to what we are doing as a fully online university. So would AUN consider in the very near future integrating or having something that is um, specifically or uh, more appropriate to online universities like us? Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Madam, for President, Madam President, for your, your question. Uh, which is uh, the thing that I've been thinking a lot. The the direct answer is that there are two parts. Part part uh, first part is that uh, online learning is part of the method of delivery in the uh, AUNQA uh, uh, system. So. Uh, I think it will stay there. That, that's my first part. My second part is that I really hope that uh, this platform achieves something that I can make use of <laughs> in terms of if you ca could come up with the, 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 the sole full system of how to do the quality assurance of, of online learning as such, we, we really need your expertise uh, there. Uh, in short, I'd like to borrow it from you, <laughs> if, if you could come up with. But at the same time, I, I'd like to work with you if you have, um, if you have a project to develop such a QA framework for online learning. Uh, I, I, I pledge my support. I can provide you with some of our experts. I'm not the expert, I'm just the uh, executive. But we got uh, experts from both our region and from the, the European region and Australia as well, if you like. And I would say my support to you will be for free of charge. <laughs> as well. If, if you come up with the project, I promise you to send our expert. I will pay for the airfare of the experts. Airfare and hotel. And the rest you pay. <laughs> uh, I, I really mean it. I, I, I'd like to see such a, a system developed by, by these experts institution as well. You are not, not only the expert as a person, but expert institutions. A AUN has very little, very little experience in online delivery. We, we are more of the uh, a very uh, classic institutions. So uh, that. that kind of I asked the question because uh, we, we have the same uh, bottom line, and that is the learning outcomes. Uh, when we look at our QA, uh, it's also looking at the learning outcomes. And you always, I mean, in, in your talk and um, 
in all my um, uh, the, the chances that I've had the discussion with our AU and QA experts, they also emphasize the same thing. And I know that we are looking at the same thing, and that's learning outcomes. Thank you. Uh, th th that's right, Madam President. At the heart of it is the learning outcome, but it functions in many areas. Not, not only the design of curriculum, but also the QA, also uh, other things. Uh, for example, uh, employers' engagement, we, we use the learning outcome as the tools. Very much agree. And I, I hope to see it deployed in online learning. Yes, yes thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the very enlightening presentation to all of us. And I very much welcome uh, for your collaboration in the future. Yes, Ibu Mel, <laughs> Madam Mel, and to everybody of us. Yes, that's right. That's a good project to go, I think. Uh, I have one thing uh, that we need uh, uh, of my concern, perhaps, of our concern. Uh, so far, we have been talking about all the positive side about online learning, how AUN can perhaps also involve with us and, uh, you know, providing qualification framework, etc., etc. But we need to be aware also with the diploma mill situation. Uh, uh, as, you know, as an innovation, it has two sides of the coins and the diploma mills has been, you know, uh, especially right now in Indonesia, we are facing really, really huge wave of these diploma mills. Uh, everybody is saying it's online. It means that it is not only a delivery mode, which is, you know, one teacher to 30 uh, students in one course, for example, uh, but it is uh, implemented by online delivery. But it, it is a kind of uh, quote-unquote diploma mill, so once teachers suddenly become one million students uh, for one million students and without any regulation, etc., etc. How we can uh, collaborate together to uh, prevent something like this? Uh, I believe, like uh, Michael was saying, that actually MOOCs is very potential. It is the future of our journey in education. However, the downside is this diploma mills. Perhaps you can share your thoughts. Thank you. I, 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 I don't have the in-depth knowledge on, on this, but I can relate to you a certain story from, we, under AUN we have a network, for example, the network of the, the libraries, university libraries. They also analyze the, the positive and negative aspects of the, the so-called learner's behavior in, in the modern, modern digital societies. Uh, as you mentioned, they, they found a lot from their analysis, a lot of uh, negative side. And uh, we all know that the, 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 the roles and functions of the library, university library must, must change. And one of the things that I, I like to push forward is that there should be the one of the main uh, uh, organizations in the university that deal with uh, MOOCs or uh, online learning services. Uh, that, that, that one, one story. Uh, another story that uh, within ASEAN itself, the, 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 the theme of the online threat it go, go beyond our education field is gone to the the threat, for example, uh, online recruitment of of students to the terrorist organization, and that that worries uh, 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 the ASEAN authority quite quite a lot, including m uh, many uh, ASEAN member states. Um, so it it, uh, it go beyond. Yeah. Our, our education field. Right now, for example, uh, the, I don't know where you can get it, but there is an AI machine, chat GPT, 
that will provide all the answers to the students for take-home exams, for uh, essay uh, quizzes, etc. So we, as a professor, will that uh, <laughs> will then be cheated by our students because the answer is actually taken from the <laughs> from the application. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we are a little bit behind of time right now. I wish we would have much more time, but uh, uh, sorry. Uh, Dr. Pongtawat, would you like to give a quick comment, please? Okay, thank you very much for sharing the AUN perspective. Uh, I think the, the work AUN has been doing the, uh, is uh, benefiting the undergraduate student and graduate student a lot, right? is in the uh, university level. Um, as I'm coming from the industrial side, I'm not from a university, so we are talking about the reskilling and upskilling, so I'm interested about something like uh, not a full-blown uh, program, not a, diploma, uh, not a degree program, but maybe smaller a certificate program or something like that, which I believe that it, it will be more common and uh, university will be uh, taking more parts in, in this reskilling and upskilling of the workforce. So uh, I would like to know the Asian perspective on, on this kind of uh, maybe shorter course or shorter program that is coming. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, very short, short answer. Um, Malaysia is the, the leading country in, in doing this uh, micro-credentialing thing uh, that uh, serves the industry very well in, in collaboration with the industry. Uh, apart from that, I wouldn't go too far to say I, I could see a, a more a good practices from within other countries. I think the starting point should be that we have a look at what the, the Malaysian University uh, doing. But that's also another aspect. When, when we talk about mi micro-credentialing, another aspect is that it may not involve university at all. It, it can be provided, as you mentioned, by anyone. That, that's another aspect. This uh, demands a lot of attention from, from the government people, from, from the policy maker, because on the one hand, employers want uh, graduates, or, or not, not necessarily graduates, want the workers that are ready to do the job. Uh, but on the other hand, some employers not all, some, uh, don't trust the uh, credential issued by the university. Mm. And that may be the coming trend. I, I, don't, I don't see that as the main major force as of now, but, but it may be in the future. If, if universities are too slow to, to adapt, uh, now, nowadays, uh, from my experience working with the AUNQA assessment, because we have to involve employers, each assessment we involve at least 20 employers per, per uh, deg one degree program. From our interview, they are still very patient with us, but I don't know for how long. Uh, meaning that they still uh, cooperate well they suggested some certain good advice, for example. They, for example, in, in one country, uh, we assess the engineering degree. They said they also want uh, engineering graduates who have a good ethical, eth ethical code of conduct. Because in that country, there's a lot of, you know, in the project management. In, in some countries, we also found out that em employers want graduate with a, a very global perspective, but at the same time, uh, not 
ignoring the 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 local gems cultural heritage that that exists so that that one when we assess i, I can mention the name when we assess the a architecture degree program in indonesia for example they want graduates that know both the local heritage and the the, the global trend and could combine because that that's the as asset in uh, the design so that's that's another example uh, another one for short example is that nowadays most employers demands english skill from graduates that, that's the trend as i mentioned so far employers are still very patient with us Thank you so much, um, <laughs> uh, Mr. Director. Okay, he really deserves a big hand, of course. Uh, since we are behind, a little bit behind of time, we should cut it short. <laughs> May I please invite Madam Director of TCU to present uh, Dr. Cholotit token of appreciation, so please. And after this, I would like to call everyone for a group photo. I mean, everyone on site first. <laughs> Thank you. So once again, thank you so much, sir. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I please invite everyone to come up to the front of the room for a group photo. Or oh, stay, you staying and we take a photo back from the stage. Okay, stay where you are. The photographer will go on the stage and take the photo backward. How we do it? Oh, we need the signage. Okay, we need the signage. So I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, so please. Some, some, please um, go up on the stage, please. Come, come, come. Come. So everyone, please join. The speakers okay. on the stage. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the host. <laughs> the host. Yeah. 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 Okay, anyone else? All right. Okay, now, may I please remove your mask and hold your breath? Don't talk for, for five minutes. Oh, no. Okay. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a 10 minutes break. And after that, we will be hearing presentations from ASEAN nations, including secret from the country like Indonesia, Korea, Malaysia, and all. So see you in 10 minutes.
we adapted it from the European. Mm. And they also have practiced this part, part of the, the learning mm. on it. But, but actually, Malaysia is a, we got a good result from Malaysia. Mm. We could measure it well. Yeah. <laughs> we have yeah. this uh, MOOC Quality Assurance Guideline, mm. MOOC Malaysia Quality Assurance ah. Guideline.
Bibel ist sehr schön, aber mit Menschen, die sich auch für Stars der Musikszene ausweisen. Und ich gehe zu Ray Back zu The Roots. Wir partizipieren online, on Zoom und on Facebook Group. We will receive other messages. That is awesome. Gentlemen, welcome back. Allow me to introduce you our next session. The next session will be the presentation on the subject at the moment of this unprecedented and online learning. The presentation will be by alphabetical order of the speaking country. We will start with Indonesia and we will travel to Korea. To Malaysia, to the Philippines, and then lastly, here, Thailand. Okay, each presenter will be assigned about 60 minutes for their presentation with five minutes for Q&A. So all up 20 minutes. Is it question? Uh, I would say around that. Around that. Okay, and uh, we will start with the first country who will travel to Indonesia. This year, it is an absolute honor to have Professor Paulina Pennen, Chairman of IBD Institute, Universitas Terbuka, Indonesia, with us. Ladies and gentlemen, without further delay, welcome Professor Paulina. Special thanks to my pro uh, dearest friend, Professor Tiffany from uh, Thai Sabri University, who has been hosting and generous enough to provide us with everything for today's meeting, which is a very important meeting as we start uh, together to talk about the ASEAN move in ASEAN countries. Usually we talk about it uh, in each of our country, our own country, but now gathered here together with the facilitation and the hosting from Thai Cyber University uh, to talk about, to discuss about uh, MOOC in Asian countries. Allow me to start with the Indonesian one. Uh, MOOC in Indonesia actually uh, emerged from the Asian Federation of Asia. And that's why uh, I think uh, what we want to do uh, what we start in Indonesia is to take a look at the different education stories okay and the milestones starting from the 1950s when the Indonesian Federation Moved to Indonesia, starting with the Indonesian Training Act. Along those uh, course of time, until 2021, where I instituted Indonesia Cyber Education Institute is being uh, established. Mostly, the intention or the goals of uh, distance education in Indonesia has been widening access to education. Why? Because we have more than uh, you know 20 million uh, graduates per year uh, who can 
go into higher education but our higher education system is uh, can only take about 38 percent per year up to now so widening access to higher education that is the first one and the second one is equity in education because we have uh, what we call a treaties area that is uh, the remote areas the disadvantaged areas and the uh, less benefit uh, benefited areas where uh, students cannot go outside their areas because of economics or time constraint uh, to study so we want the education to come to them so that is uh, equity uh, in education the other thing is that as we have already mentioned just now about the quality of education in Indonesia there's a lot uh, there's a high disparity among uh, all the uh, higher education institutions as well as the practices which is not uh, very much uh, what they call uh, acceptable to all of us academician uh, that is the diploma mill so we want to distribute quality education for everyone not nobody left behind and they said so that's that's mostly the the intention or the goals of distance education in Indonesia uh, however in the late 10 years I believe it is already shifting the intention and the goals is a bit shifting the first one uh, not only widening access but also increasing higher education gross enrollment ratio so that is very quantitative we need to increase that why we mirror to we learn from South Korea for example South Korea has already got 95% GRE uh, GER <laughs> gross enrollment ratio and Indonesia right now is about uh, I don't know around 60 something percent so it's is really low in terms of higher education yeah uh, and now uh, in 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 the ministry itself it has per year it has about 38 percent only so that's one thing the other thing is that we have a uh, new uh, trends or new movement that is preparing our graduates for pre or pre-employed graduates to be ready for working uh, we have a lot uh, of problems like 10% uh, or 11% of our graduates could not find work uh, then the industry said that because they are not ready for working so that's why we also shift the goals of our distance education not only for widening access and quality education but also for preparing our graduates or pre-employed graduates to be ready for working we have the policies regarding distance education including MOOCs in it uh, in which we said that any uh, study programs face-to-face -face or conventional study programs can have up to 49 percent courses delivered via online in the form of MOOCs or blended course so it's up to them uh, because usually the academic community wants to decide by themselves fine but it it can only go up to 49 percent out of the curriculum so that's one thing the other thing is that uh, if you go beyond that then it means it is a new study program a distance education study program which has to have uh, permission legal permission from the uh, ministry uh, the other thing is that uh, the newest policy regarding Merdeka Belajar Campus Merdeka or Freedom Learning Freedom Campus this new policy is related very much to the preparation of graduates or pre-employed graduates for working uh, the ministry said that uh, through this freedom learning freedom campus students can go out of the uh, campus for three semester whether they can use it for internship other uh, programs like for example 
uh, making a project in the village or you know doing a research or students exchange or uh, independently study so the goals for this uh, merdeka belajar kampus merdeka or mbkm we call it is to increase the quality graduate for uh, working increase quality of the curriculum hopefully we can follow the aun experience just now <laughs> And then we also hope that we can uh, increase quality of researchers by exchanging them with each other and also internationally. Uh, the MOOCs in Indonesia started in 2014, so it's, it's not really that, that long as uh, distance education, but uh, still it is moving uh, forward. Uh, the first one is Spada Indonesia, officiated in 2014, and then ICE Institute 2021, and then of course the universities also uh, are able to develop their own MOOCs, like we have the UI, University Indonesia MOOCs, the UT MOOCs, Universitas Terbuka, the BINUS MOOCs, etc. There are a lot of uh, uh, other universities in Indonesia that develop their own MOOCs for their own purposes. And there is also private sectors like Haruka Edu uh, is the first one started. And then Indonesia X, second one. And then there is also Ruang Guru, etc. However, I don't know what happened, really. This is very interesting. Lately, they're just kind of dying down. This is, this is the startup that I was thinking that will uh, they will grow bigger and bigger, perhaps becoming the unicorn later on. But I don't know, about three to f uh, five years after their, uh, their initial setup, they are kind of, you know, diminishing right now. They, they are facing a lot of problems. So, Spada Indonesia launched in 2014. We got uh, 500,000 students uh, joining, 50,000 lecturers. If we are talking about Indonesia, the number is always big. So, <laughs> okay. And then uh, we have 2,000 uh, institutions joining. We have 20,000 module, 1,500 courses, etc. So this is the Spada Indonesia is still going on. However, right now, Spada Indonesia is more treated by the university as an open resources. So uh, their students in any university would like to take the courses, can go to SPADA, but still the uh, university professor is there. So they're using the SPADA courses as the open educational resources instead of fully MOOC or uh, blended learning itself. And then we have the Universitas Terbuka uh, courses, uh, MOOCs of course, and then we have the Universitas Indonesia, and we have the Great Nusa or Binus uh, University, and then uh, we have the Haruka Edu, and like I said, the Ruang Guru Online, and also Indonesia X. Indonesia X is already uh, died down. Haruka Edu is still hanging in there, but with very slow. Uh, Ruang Guru is decreasing. So that's, uh, that will be interesting for all of us to compare, I believe. In each country, hopefully, it will be different. And then we have the ICE Institute, which is very new, uh, only two years old, up to now, one and a half, perhaps. Uh, we were officiated in 2021. We have about 33 uh, members uh, of the consortium. We have courses, about 649, our own courses, but we are open since we collaborate also with EDX and also Coursera right now and SuitangX.com and then who else? Uh, UNESCO, uh, ICHE, IIOE. So all their collections are open to our uh, users. And then the number of institutions joining as users is about 340 for institution. The students currently is 8,000 something. And then we also offer the micro credential for game developer and also research collaboration. That's why uh, 
I'm offering any of you, if you would like to have international research collaboration with ICE Institute, we can do that. Uh, send your students to me for that uh, master's degree or uh, doctoral degree for research collaboration with our staff. And then what we have here is the collection, uh, ladies and gentlemen, these are the collection of ICE Institute uh, in the ICE Institute uh, website. We have the potential in Indonesia itself because it is very large population, very large country, and the internet penetration is very promising. However, we have the challenge, yes, first of all, digital literacy. Digital literacy coming is not only from uh, students, uh, students uh, generation Z and generation Y, I believe, is much more literate than us in terms of digital literacy. However, the lecturer and also the system itself, you know, the system, uh, some of the uh, courses that is being uh, developed, for example, by the faculty member is just repeating the face-to-face -face classroom, actually, putting it together in the digital format into what they call MOOC, but that is not MOOC, actually. So we need to, <laughs> to do something with it. And perhaps through collaboration, we can do that. And then the collaboration. This has to go with the sustainability because I believe in terms of MOOCs, if we do not collaborate, it will be difficult, it will be expensive, it will be energy wasting. So we need to collaborate, like for example, all the MOOCs in the Philippines can be accessible by the Indonesian market. And the Indonesian MOOCs can also be available in the Thai market, etc. So if we collaborate, it's easy for us, you know, to have great collection, wider collection for everybody, so that, uh, you know, uh, choosing the courses will be much merrier. You know, if we go to the mall, we would like to see a lot of uh, fashions, etc. Not only a single uh, store of the fashion, right? Usually like that. So we need to collaborate. And that will also guarantee uh, sustainability. If we collaborate and we build our uh, MOOCs at the same quality level, for example, we learn from each other, that will... Uh, provide us uh, sustainability, just like uh, Professor uh, Coltis, I believe, the director of AUN mentioned. And then the, 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 <laughs> the difficult part is recognition, of course. It is not the students uh, doesn't want to take the MOOCs, but their efforts usually are not being recognized by the university. Uh, they, they cannot be integrated into the curriculum or even if it is integrated, it's only an additional or elective courses. So usually, you know, they understand, the students understand these courses are off top university. Why is it only regarded as elective or additional course? So uh, they require a lot more recognition and we as provider also would like to have a lot more recognition. So the best thing is that if we can open access to everyone in the country, you know, uh, exchange access, perhaps we can see how uh, we can uh, recognize each other uh, in terms of our MOOCs. And if there is standard, uh, like Ibu Nurbiha said, uh, across uh, countries in, in terms of MOOCs, that will be much better. Uh, I have already uh, did some uh, research in terms of social emotional experience, for example, in our students, the first, second, uh, two semesters. Well, uh, as usual, you know, students is not really that enthusiastic. Uh, what we called that perhaps it is because the one developing the ICE Institute is already with the gray hair from traditional generation, not from Gen C. <laughs> okay, we need to shape up our website, our courses, etc., with the more younger perspective, right? 
And then for the technology acceptance model, uh, the students reflected that, well, uh, the ease of access to online course influenced greatly towards the benefit felt by the users, uh, although they don't have uh, facilities, etc. However, the ease of access cannot be done without a good connection of internet. And that is, the, I think, the current problem in Indonesia still, especially at the remote area. And for the lecturers, they said that availability of facilities, they don't want to borrow the laptop from the office, they want to use their own laptop in at home, for example, and then also have the internet provided, etc. So uh, this is just a reflection coming from students and also coming from the lecturers. So that's about it in Indonesia right now. We are moving forward. Once again, I call for the collaboration among us and everybody would like to do a collaboration in any ways in terms of uh, developing some tools together that will apply for all of us or doing the research or contributing and opening access. Thank you very much. Wow, that is very insightful. Now we learn about Indonesian secret. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Please stay on the stage, please. Okay. Um, any questions uh, from the floor, please, or any comments, please? Uh, before, don't get panic. Since we are behind the time, we <laughs> will make a little bit of a program alteration. Philippines and Thailand will now um, be presenting after lunch break. Oh. So now we have <laughs> more time to breathe. Okay. Okay, so if you have any things you'd like to discuss or you want to ask, please do now. Ajahn Jintawi, please. Yes. Uh, Professor Paulina, um, the, your model about um, the collaboration with the private sector, you mentioned about um, um, the, the other move platform, the international one like Coursera, uh -huh. and another one I, I could, could not recall, but how it works like uh, in collaboration with those private sector yes. because it's all very interesting. Thank you. Can I, can I say that it is only for this room? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, hopefully nobody is from Coursera or EDX here, okay? <laughs> because we found out that, okay, for, uh, especially from Coursera and EDX, uh, regarding the Swetang X, etc., we got all, everything for free. For, from EDX and Coursera, actually, we got what we called education bundle. So we negotiate at the very lowest price possible that's one thing and they can use us yeah. at the highest possible to their expense okay it's just an exchange that's one thing like marketing and putting always putting edx and coursera in my uh, powerpoint etc that is marketing for them and uh, that's one thing second thing is that we learn that coursera is very good in terms of their service like, for example, they are doing curation for curriculum based on our request. Like, for example, I request, okay, uh, please uh, send us some micro-credentials uh, curriculum, potential micro-credentials for uh, teachers' uh, digital transformation. Like, for example, big data for teachers, they will come up with several uh, courses, etc. And they are willing to provide a certificate for those micro credentials. So that's, that's really good. Okay? However, with EDX, it is not like that. EDX is more toward the facilitating. They said, okay. I was able to negotiate the, the same price for three semesters instead of one year. Okay, so for one dollar, for example, I said three semester, not <laughs> one year. Okay, I said. so it's, it's more toward that, so we can gather more uh, participants, okay. Uh, for three semesters, for example, you can get three people, right, in terms of MOOCs, not the one all the time. 
uh, in terms of uh, courses in the curriculum, degree program, yes, you can get only one. But in terms of MOOCs, you can have uh, for each semester different students. So uh, uh, EDX is facilitating that way. So that's, that's our experience. Please negotiate hard with them. <laughs> we need to learn from you. <laughs> thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Orina, thank you so much for your presentation. I, <coughs> I think that we are go in the second phase of MOOC courses. And actually, let me uh, ask you back to the, uh, the during the COVID pandemic, uh, how how is uh, I see that you are instill what that you promote MOOC or and how feeling of the student and how feeling of the like the instructor use that one or anything could you please uh, like the chair us with the situation yeah. in Indonesia thank you thank you uh, uh, madam president <laughs> of, of Thai Un uh, cyber university uh, in Indonesia during the the covid-19 ice is is just providing everything including the blended mode situation because it's a mandatory from the government that it is an online the only online uh, platform available in Indonesia so we have to provide everything so now we are trying to select which one is our priority because we cannot provide a lot of things okay uh, because right now they are already going back to face-to-face -to -face, uh, situation okay conventional teaching and learning process in the uh, what you call in the campus mostly but some of them a little bit they are doing still uh, what you call uh, remote learning or uh, learning from home situation and uh, the MBKM program is still open so we can join that uh, so the the what you call the enrollment is a little bit down and uh, f coming from the big cities from the big universities because they are already into the face-to-face -face, uh, again However, the government said that now you have to go to the three T's areas, the remote areas, the disadvantaged areas, the, the outer part of Indonesia. So that's how we do it. And then the other thing is that we become the national ambassador for education, for example, uh, ICE Institute, like offering a diplomacy uh, collaboration with Sri Lanka because they are uh, economically going down and uh, we could not help in terms of economics but we can help in terms of offering education for them coming from uh, the international setting so that's that's what we are doing and we hope also to be able to do that to Nepal and Bhutan etc and some African countries so those those are the things uh, uh, Professor Tiffany and that's why I would like to uh, suggest once again collaboration in terms of accessing each other so that we can open you know uh, even if you are still in Thailand but still you can assist together we can assist uh, Africa and we can assist you know ma many more countries you can take advantage of us thank you okay thank you so much so Give a big hand to her again, please. Thank you. Thank you. May I please uh, invite Mademoiselle Director Tapani to present the token of appreciation. Ladies and gentlemen, so far keywords from our presenters involving heavily on uh, collaboration. So let's hear from our next presenter whether collaboration will be needed or will be focused 
as well or not. Next, it is my absolute honor again to be hearing from Republic of Korea. In this session, we will be hearing from Dr. Hun Ju So. Dr. So is the director of external affairs at National Institute of Lifelong Education of the Republic of Korea, or what we know in yeah. short as NILE NILE. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor So. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the audience on site and the online audience. Uh, thank you for having me uh, this wonderful venue. Uh, I want to, today, what I want to talk about is, I briefly mentioned the definition of MOOCs and background uh, for KMOOC and objective and missions for KMOOC. I just briefly mentioned. And then I a little bit uh, explain uh, more about ecosystem of KMOOCs and the credit recognition and use, usage of KMOOCs. And then I briefly mentioned uh, the roadmap for KMOOC and uh, we are now in search of our sustainable model for KMOOCs. So I, I will conclude by just briefly explain what we are considering. Okay? So uh, most of you knows what the MOOC is. So the KMOOC is Korean style, free, online, based, this kind of life learning programs. So that's it. And the background. Uh, there are two uh, important challenges facing uh, Republic of Korea. The first one is the international spread of MOOCs and to the shifting paradigm of higher education. Uh, between 2012 and 2015, there emerged uh, many MOOCs around the globe. So many Korean universities of Co and also the Ministry of Education, they were very interested in the spread of MOOCs. So the Ministry of Education, they wants to respond to the inst international spread of MOOCs and the paradigm shift in higher education. So, as I mentioned, uh, the Korean universities were increasingly interested in MOOCs, yet there were limits for their response to this at the individual university level. This is because there was no independent common MOOC platforms and also there is no supporting uh, and uh, dedicated agencies like National Institute for Lifelong Education. So in order to enhance the global competitiveness of universities in Korea, the Ministry of Education, they began to consider actively the introduction of Korean style MOOCs program in 2014. And second background is uh, due to the rapid aging population and high job uh, mobility in Korean society, there has been a great demand for higher lifelong learning for people's continuous competency development. Uh, in the case of Korea, uh, both people's interest in and their demand for lifelong learning have been increasing owing to the decrease in adult competency and the prospects of a decrease in the working force aged between 15 to 65, 64. These suggest that it is necessary to lay the foundation for lifelong learning, as well as to contribute to the development of natural, national human resource development through digitizing, opening, and sharing quality universities' learning resources systematically. So against this backdrop, 
the Korea, we introduced MOOC service, KMOOC service for general publics and also university students. So here, 2000, uh, October 14th of 2015, the KMOOC service officially launched. So uh, around 10 universities, actually top tier university, they participate in KMOOC service uh, originally, the including Seoul National University, Yonsei University, and Korea University, Chungwang University, to mention uh, just a few. And next, uh, the objectives and missions of KMOOCs. Uh, there are four objectives uh, at the same time missions. The first one is through MOOCs, introducing MOOCs, innovating teaching and learning method in higher education. And the second, uh, as I mentioned before, the MOE, the Ministry of Education, they pro uh, take, have, proactive stance against the international proliferation of MOOCs. And thirdly, uh, the MOE, they want to realize equal opportunities for higher education and lifelong learnings for uh, general public in Korea. And finally, uh, through these objectives, the MOE, they want to established a foundation for lifelong learning in the era of Homo 100. So that, that is the object and missions of KMU. And now look at the ecosystem of KMU. Uh, as, as you can see, the slides, uh, there are about five actors in KMU ecosystems. The first, uh, most important is the Ministry of Education. The MOE, as government organizations, is located on the top of KMOOC service delivery systems. The primar primary roles of MOE are to establish annual basic operation plan for KMOOC service at the beginning of each year, as well as to supervise its overall operations. The second, is National Institute for Lifelong Education. I belong to the National Institute for Lifelong Education. Uh, it's kind of, Nile is kind of implementation organizations. So under the supervision of the Minister of Education, we implement the KMOOC service. I think that's, that's enough uh, explanation. And thirdly, the KMOOC service has the Course Evaluation and Selection Committee. This committee is in charge of deliberation on overall KMOOC curriculum development and operations, including review of similarities uh, and overlap with existing courses, selection of courses which are to be developed, and deliberation of performance evaluation results. The thirdly, uh, fourth, there's a KMOOC steering committees. There are some couple of committees uh, place important roles of advising on various matters related to management and operation of a KMOOC service, service, as well as consulting and deliberating on matters related to performance evaluation and project managing, management inspections. The committee is also operated by Department of KMOOC Operation Unit uh, at National Institute for Lifelong Education and supervised by the MOE. And fifth, uh, there is uh, some MOOC development and operation institutions. Uh, until recently, most of them have been higher education institu institutions. As content, contents provider and operators, they are obliged to establish an annual business plan to report its progress as well as its performance. Further, they are recommended to participate in the MOOC uh, University Council, consists of 
participating uh, universities. The sixth and finally, there are various relevant organizations and MOU institutions. Uh, they include national and international institutions as well as public and private ones. For example, the government ministries in Korea, uh, such as the Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Employment and Labor, have actively promote uh, KMO contents as a regular in-service vocational training for their officers and staffs. Next, education broad broadcasting systems uh, and Chungang Dongyang Broadcasting Company, JTBC, as quite uh, newly uh, emerged and also famous broadcasting systems, uh, have made a strategic partnership with KMOOC service and provide the newly designed quality short MOOC series, such as Great Minds and Differential KMOOC class since 2021. So, and also, uh, KMO service has uh, maintained a constructive and cooperative relationship with uh, foreign MOOCs platforms, including Fun MOOC, uh, uh, France, and Thai MOOC, Thailand, and Suetang since uh, 2017. The exchange and cooperation between KMOOC and foreign MOOC platforms take various forms, such as cross-roading of contents and provision of multilingual subtitles. And maybe this is the focus of my presentations, uh, credit recognition and usages. Starting from 2017, when the KMOOC service was stabilized to a certain degree, the Ministry of Education has begun to actively consider promoting both uh, accreditation and usage of KMOOCs because the KMOOC service is funded by uh, national grants, people's tax. So if we, if somebody or if the National Institute for Lifelong Education developed uh, some learning contents, it should be used by wider public. So, uh, MOE, they, take, they took various policy options. The first one, it has expanded the use, usage of MOOCs and credit recognition among KMOOC leading universities. We nominate, we designate leading MOOC universities, about 50 something. And second, it has encouraged credit recognition and exchange between KMOOC participating universities by making MOU one another. And third, it has also fostered the development and use of KMOOCs by non-participating universities. So non-participating universities, we encourage them uh, for their students to take the courses provided by MOOC participating universities. And fourth, uh, it has promoted both public institutions and private corporates to use KMOOCs in their in-service vocational education and training and adult lifelong educations. The finally, it has uh, offered participating institutions the best practice of credit recognition as a reference and built a credit recognition uh, related information systems, thereby allow allowing learners to easily check the availability of accreditation status at a glance. So we, make, we made a system thereby uh, learners, they can easily access and then check the availability of uh, credit recognition of MOOCs. And also, the revision of the enforcement degree of Act on Recognition of Ar Academic Credits in 2018 had served as a great Im impetus for the expansion of credit recognition and the usage of KMOOCs. And after that, uh, some follow-up measures followed. The first one, KMOOC platform has improved. It introduced a couple of new features such as test flow 
prevention systems and progress uh, monitoring systems in order to enhance the cred credibility of key MOOC-based academic credits of academic credit bank system in 2019. Secondly, KMOOC service has supported the opening of credit recognition courses at existing KMOOC participating universities, all of which are assessed and recognized by the academic credit bank system. Thirdly, this kind of uh, measures has been also uh, encouraged by providing the participating universities which developed and operate the credit recognition courses with the financial incentives, which supports credit recognition course operation cost, including examination preparation, grading, and TA employment cost, approximately US dollar $10,000 per course, as well as with a preferential treatment, which gives a participating university an additional extra point for yearly assessment of chemo operations. So every year, the participating universities, they have to undergo the assessment uh, process. So if they give some credit recognition course, they get extra point. So that is the kind of the incentives. So now this is a brief, uh, our the roadmap for KMOOC service. The first, first phase uh, covers 2015 until 2018. And so we are now the third phase. So the third phase focused on the introduction of a paid service. But currently, we haven't in, uh, introduced the paid service because as I mentioned before, the KMOOC service is funded, has been funded by national grant. So the parliamentary members haven't allowed the MOE to introduce the paid service. But in the next five years, I think the MOE, they will actively consider introducing a paid service. So next slide, I can give you some, uh, we are trying to find the sustain, sustainable model of the KMOOCs. So there are two points in our sustainable models. The first one is introduction of a new degree program and digital badge. So introduce a new degree scheme in which a learner can obtain either associate degree or bachelor's degree by selecting and combining, uh, that is, curating the online courses in the digital field, such as metaverse, AI, software. The learners pay course fee to content providers, such as university and corporates. So now the KMOOC expands their courses, including KMOOC contents and other online contents provided by private or public institutions. So learners, they can choose and combine. And then they get their degrees. And also to connect the course completion results to digital badges to expand and support the job opportunities thereby enhancing the usage of MOOCs. MOOCs. For example, KMOOCs, the Metro programs, also which, uh, which uh, operated by Nile, and universities online courses and corporate online courses. So we try to connect the, all those online courses. The second is expansion of openness and sharing of quality MOOCs. The promote the development of brand new style MOOC courses such as competence and skill-based short-term courses, maybe micro-credit micro credit course, uh, as well as university joint MOOC courses. So usually the MOOC participating universities, they develop and operating their own MOOCs only. But, okay, uh, now 
learners they can link and combining different MOOCs provided by different universities. If they finished, they can get some kind of qualifications. That's the, our future uh, point. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Opa. <laughs> this is no wonder why I always refer to him as K Mook Daddy. Since I known him for I think nearly ten years, he was a fundamental person pushing the success of K Mook since the day one. So I think we have heard from the best guy who can share with us about K Mook. So with this, we learned that k -Mook is very advanced, as you can see from his slide. Perhaps this is the only MOOC that talk about big data so far since this morning. So that is a big advancement. So um, I would now open the floor. If you have any questions or comments, please. Or even from online, if you have any questions. OK, online people ask for slides. Okay, with permission from the speakers, if we receive the permission, we will surely make the slides available to the public to download, okay? Um, but now, if you have any questions or comments, please. Okay, Professor Tapani. Thank you very um, much, Dr. Su, for your wonderful comments, presentation. Okay, Actually, for our collaboration, Thai MOOC, between Thai MOOC and K MOOC in the past and continue to present. Actually, uh, could you please uh, like the more, give us for more detail for our K MOOC courses that collaborate for Thai MOOC and please continue to the model of K, K MOOC credit bank or Korea credit bank transfer from all move from all universe, uh, Korea University. Is it possible? Example like how that university that opened the MOOC courses under the K MOOC project, they can, how they can keep the credit and they, how, how they transfer each credit to their university, something like that. I trust that you will give us for more detail on that one because of uh, Thailand is just start for our uh, national credit bank system. We trust that Korea is our mentor for this project. Thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned my, during my presentations, the, since 2017, uh, MOE, the Ministry of Education, strongly uh, recommend the universities to introduce the credit recognitions. And also, as I, as I mentioned before, the, I think this is very important to establish the legal basis for uh, introducing credit recognition. Usually in Korea, if the government set a kind of reference or legal frames, and then universities, they follow. That is, it's kind of like a culture. So for example, the val validation of prior uh, learnings, for example, uh, the government, they try to introduce that policy scheme to universities. The universities, they hesitate to introduce that kind of scheme. So the Ministry of Education, they actively persuade the university chair to consider that kind of policy schemes. But the, on the side of university, they said, 
oh, there's no legal, legal framework for introducing this kind of uh, difficult insti institutions. So the first one is the government, for government to lay the foundation, legal foundations for that institutions. So 2019, around 19, the Minister of Education, they revised the law. And then suddenly the university, they changed their attitudes towards the credit recognition. So I just briefly mentioned uh, Just uh, I give you some status of regular uh, credit recognition by uh, participating universities is as follows. A total of 41 universities participate in KMOOC academic credit recognition scheme. More specifically, while 164 MOOCs were recognized as regular credit course by universities themselves, which developed and operate their own MOOCs. And 413 MOOCs were accepted as a regular credit course at other universities, which do not provide or operate MOOCs. And also, uh, regardless of whether they were MOOC contents providers or not. In addition, the number of MOOCs which were recognized as official, official credit course in the academic credit, course, credit system, bank systems rose up to 32 for in 2021 from 27 in 2020. So I think the first is kind of uh, the responsibility of government is to lay the legal foundations for credit recognitions and then uh, appreciate the universities and corporates to accept. Okay, uh, please. Uh, Tai, have microphone. Um, you were saying that there are courses that is credit bearing and recognized, mm -hmm. and I assume there are also courses that is not credit bearing and not credit recognized. How and what is is there any existing standards yes. that differentiate these two? How do you define that this course is credit bearing and not credit bearing? Is there any standards or is there any reviewing process to that specific MOOCs that can differentiate that? Or is it just that because this university has participated in KMOOC Alliance and that means all of the MOOCs offered by that university is credit bearing? Mm. <laughs> All right. Very good. 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 I think, uh, uh, as I as mentioned, I, the, the book delivery, delivery systems, systems of KMOX service, service, I think, I there, think there, there, there's there's no, no officially, officially the, the body, body to, to review, review what, what you mentioned. You mentioned. But, but I think, I think the, the university themselves, themselves they, they choose. choose. On the, on the basis of, of like, like kind of quality, quality or, or the, acceptance the acceptance of, of the professor. The professor. Yeah, so, so. Yeah. Yeah. so yeah, what I mean to say is that um, I was um, thinking if there are any expert reviews on that MOOCs or oh, like, yes, yes. yeah. The, we, have we have two, two levels, levels of, of quality, quality control, control systems. systems. The, the MOE, MOE and, and National, National Institute, Institute for Lifelong, for Lifelong Education, Education, we maintain, we maintain a specific, specific uh, committee, committee on quality assurance. assurance. And, also and also, universities, universities themselves, themselves, they have, they have internal, internal quality, 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 quality
quality assurance mechanism. It's, it's, it's compulsory. compulsory. But, but so, so all, all of MOOCs provide, provide the key MOOC platforms, platforms uh, quality, quality assured, assured contents. contents. But still, but still some, some key MOOCs, key MOOCs they, they are credited, credited courses, courses, recognition courses, but others are not. So, on, because the university does not recognize, or how the university? university themselves they decide oh, okay. because the MOE or the National Institute for Lifelong Education they cannot like force them to like uh, accept what we ask them to do regarding credit recognition. So they decide themselves. It's kind of uh, auto autonomy, autonom auto autonomy, something like that. Because the professors, you know, they tend to they they tend not to accept what the government asks them to do. So, okay, thank you so much, and uh, Madam Chancellor, please. Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. And uh, just like uh, Thailand, uh, we are also looking at the KMOOC uh, to guide us on how we are going to uh, move forward our uh, MOOCs in the Philippines. So actually, my question is related to her question. How do you determine, the, I mean, in terms of the uh, credit equivalency? So like, for instance, um, um, is, it, is one MOOC uh, directly equivalent to the uh, credit uh, course uh, that is uh, required under a degree program. So if I may cite an example, in the Philippines, usually our credit courses carry three units. And uh, for that to happen in a MOOC, then we have to have that long uh, course that would run for 48 hours or so, which is not advisable for a MOOC. So how do you assign uh, equivalent credits uh, to the MOOC uh, that will be uh, recognized by universities. Is there a guideline also from your MOE? Thank you. Uh, around 2017 or 2018, I, I cannot uh, remember, but uh, the early stage of KMOOC, we thought at that time I was a uh, director uh, general in, uh, in charge of KMOOC. We thought we, we, we tried to persuade the universities to uh, actively introduce the MOOC into their uh, teaching systems. So we consult, we ref refer to the long distance learning, uh, that there's a law, law related to long distance learning something. And we check that close of that law, and we find the long distance learning usually convert the hours of learning into the credit. So we concert that phrase. So maybe I think, uh, I guess 20 minutes mm -hmm. equals to like one credit something. So we request the university professors if they develop their, their own course, please assign, convert their time or course into like one credit or until uh, maximum three credit, something like that. Well, that is a great uh, example. So thank you so much, Professor. Uh, okay, Professor Jintawi, please. May I further ask a bit about you know these two questions because it's very very interesting and I think it's something that you know like we still seek the solution in yes. in you know like in Thailand. So um, those uh, credit courses, uh, may I ask about the content? What are those? I mean, you know, like uh, in, in the what kind of the content of those courses? This is the basic, the basic courses, courses, like one on one. Every 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 content. Ah, uh, it's not like the the common content that many no. university uses. But it's like sp something specialized. If, or? if if university they they 
are reluctant to accept uh. the credit recognition systems, maybe we can designate it the specific uh, subject areas, mm. like a, uh, the, the subject related to force industrial revolutions. Mm. Mm. So it, it's, we can put some priority. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, actually, uh, uh, related questions. You also mentioned that there is also a cost from the uh, private sector or industry, right? Not, not from the university, which is the cost may be also uh, accredited. I mean, the cost that is not from university is it also can be credited or not. The cost that is not from a uh, university, the cost from a company, mm -hmm. is, uh, can it be uh, uh, credited? No. The currently, we just uh, for university courses, not the, like a business side. But in the, in the next five years, uh, the MOE, the Minister of Education, they will try. So as I mentioned in, uh, during my presentations, uh, the MOE, they allow the learners to uh, select, choose, and combine, curate their own online courses provided by universities and public or private corporates. And then if they finish, complete their courses, they can get some kind of diploma or qualifications. Of course, they have to pay for their contents, learner, learn, learning. Oh, well, now we learn that perhaps in five years from now in Korea, non-academic institutions can offer credit. So that would be interesting. Just my, my final comment. Uh, the KMOX service will introduce the digital bit, the, digital but bit. the question remains, for what? Why do, have, why do we have to consider introducing paid service and digital bit? For what? Uh, if I finish some course and, and I can get digital bit, for what? So that is the most important questions that we have to address in the next five to 10 years to have some kind of sustainability of MOOCs, platforms. Uh, the, the answer is, of course, job opportunities. So we have to make a strong partnership with the private corporates, make them employ the learners who has have the digital batches. Okay, I think that is about it. Thank you very much, Professor So. And uh, may I please invite Professor Dr. Jintawi to present Professor So a token of appreciation, please. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, good time seems so short. We are approaching lunch time, but before lunch, we do have very important session coming up as well. Uh, the last presenter before lunch would be from Malaysia. And allow me to remind you again that the Philippines and Thailand will be presenting after lunch break. From now, may I please introduce Professor Nurbiha A. Shukar, Deputy Director, Center of Advancement in Digital and Flexible Learning, UTM CDX. She is also Chair, Malaysia Public University E-Learning Council, or what we know as MIAPTA. Ladies and gentlemen, as Dr. Sholatit this morning mentioned that Malaysia is doing so well in terms of quality assurance, so I believe that 
Professor Nubiha will have some secret for Malaysia to share with us. So without further delay, please welcome her. Thank you. Very good morning to everyone. So I'll be sharing about um, MOOC current trends. Sorry, Malaysia MOOC. Can I just no, not yet. So I'm going to talk about um, a little bit about um, how Malaysia is planning for uh, MOOCs um, since 2014. We started in 2014 uh, until recently. What would be our current status? And I will briefly talk about uh, mainly talk about two things. Number one is about our uh, personalized curriculum framework for MOOCs uh, that would include stackable degree. And number two is about the MOOC credit transfer in Malaysia, how it works. If KMOOC is using um, learning hours to convert that into credits, we didn't use learning hours to convert that into credits, but we use content similarity up to 80%. So I, maybe I will be explaining about that later. And um, a little bit about what we are doing currently in Malaysia related to MOOCs. So this is our main... Um, I would say uh, the guiding document, the Malaysia Higher Education Blueprint, in which it highlighted about globalized online learning and nation of lifelong learners, uh, which is shift number nine and shift number three. This is the government document, the Ministry of Higher Education document related to high, higher education in Malaysia. And under this document, we have all these initiatives related to online learning, uh, micro-credentials, massive open online courses, the My Digital Educator, Blended Learning, Online Learning, OER, and ODL. So these initiatives are government funded, uh, but um, the MOOCs initiative is initially government-led initiative, uh, it, which means that it is funded by, um, by the taxpayers, Malaysian taxpayers. However, since 2016, it is no longer um, funded by government directly, uh, but it is more like a university-led initiative. So we have in, uh, universities still uh, doing um, and developing uh, MOOCs actively, uh, and there are also universities who are moving away, not really moving away from MOOCs, but they are moving forward to micro-credentials in specific. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about micro-credentials as well, since Professor Coltis has mentioned that just now. So um, um, based on the... Um, national document that is in by 2025 we want to have more courses uh, offering in blended mode and for that we started with um, four MOOCs in Malaysia in 2014. I think uh, KMOOC started with 27 courses. We start with four universities and each university offer one courses that is shareable to all. That four courses. These four courses are compulsory courses for all Malaysian students. So these four courses is obviously a shareable courses. Although it is offered by my university, it is also has an accessible to other universities in Malaysia. 
And then we start with a credit transfer. And we, we, we try to make this alliance, the Malaysia MOOC. However, um, we went through a little bit of setback related to MOOC Malaysia, but we are going to establish that again this year. We have the national platform. I think when we met in Korea, we do not have the name yet, but now we have the name. The name is Elmi eLearning Malaysia. So that will be our national platform. Uh, we hope to establish Academic Credit Bank as well at national level. And we are going to host everything related to online learning on that platform as a national learning platform. So um, I was informed that uh, Elmi will be available in 2014. Uh, 2024 um, it is now in the process of development and for now um, previously what we understand MOOCs in Malaysia is that it is a course in which if a student or a learner enroll in that course they can quickly apply for credit transfer and usually it is a full course in which usually it carries about two credits or three credits However, recently we started to offer bite-sized courses. Previously, our courses are not bite-sized at all. Not bite-sized, it means that you know you have to spend about maybe 120 hours of learning online. And then of course you can take that, you know, you can take one month or two years even to learn that three hours three, um, 120 hours course. But recently we started to develop bite-sized courses. And then this can even carry up to only one credit. However, in Malaysia, we call these bite-sized courses as micro-credentials. We tend to call it micro-credential when in fact that it is just a normal online course. Um, but that is what uh, being widely understood. But we try to correct this misconception because MOOCs can also carry micro-credentials. MOOCs can carry credentials, bite-sized courses can also carry credentials. So that is what happened. And we have this document, national level document, guidelines on credit transfer for MOOCs. This one is a very important document in which universities use this document to convince the Senate members, uh, because we know university has their own autonomy in offering academic courses, so this document serves as the, um, to assure um, the higher education providers that when you offer MOOCs, it will be recognized even by the Malaysian Qualification Agency. So this document is very important. So universities are seeking for the validation in which the qualification agency says that yes, okay it is okay for you to offer your um, or, uh, your courses in form of MOOCs and then we have the guidelines for development and delivery of Malaysia MOOC so I think this morning we talk about how do we assure the quality of online learning so we did have um, a MOOC quality assurance document this is this document down here this is Amalan Quality MOOC Malaysia. So we try to set the, it is not a standard, um, but it is a guidelines um, that every MOOC should have when they want to offer a MOOC. That is credit bearing. So we have the calculation for learning time. We have the calculation for, um, for example, for, for video, what your video should have, the kind of subtitles and Things like that, we have that in this document. How should you write your course learning outcome? It is stated in this document. And then we have some research about that and the impacts in this book. And we also have this guidelines to good practices for micro credential. This is also an important document in which the Malaysian Qualification Agency, who qualify you know who declares that our program is up to the quality so they produce this um, we we work together to produce this micro credentials guideline um, to say that um, anyone who learn through micro credential through bite-sized courses and through MOOCs 
they can also apply for credit transfer. And then we have this document. Uh, this is when I think uh, Indonesia was saying that um, the online learning is different than ODL, up to 50%, 49%, you were saying 49%. For us in Malaysia, if an academic program offers or students learn online, up to 60% of the courses in one academic program is conducted online, it is still called traditional academic program. If 60, if that academic program has more than 60% of their courses offered online, then we call it as ODL program. When it is an ODL program, they have to apply to the Malaysian Qualification Agency again for, for the uh, new uh, registration of the program. So ours is 60% of courses. But in this ODL, although it is said that an ODL program, the delivery is open and distance, but the courses inside the ODL program has to exceed 80% delivery in an ODL mode. So in an ODL academic program, each and every courses of ODL program, it has to be more than 80% conducted in ODL mode. Then it is called ODL program. So we have two level, course level and academic program level, the percentage. So we have, oh, that is about entirely online or open and distance. We also have online learning, blended learning. We also have certain percentage for, on, for blended learning. So for courses to be declared as blended learning in Malaysia is when you deliver your courses 30% to 79% online, we use the, you know, the worldwide definition, then it is a blended learning course. When it is a blended learning course, you cannot exceed, you cannot reach that 80% that because once it is 80%, then it falls here. And then you need to apply for a new registration of the program. So we have a guideline for blended learning delivery. So we have related to online learning, as, as I mentioned just now, we have several initiatives, online learning, blended learning, MOOCs, micro-credentials, and OCW, of course. So this is, we have micro-credentials 192. When I said micro-credentials here, this means that they are in bite sizes, as I said just now. When I say it is MOOCs, then it means you have a very lengthy course that up to three hours, oh no, three credits that carries almost three credit. So that's how we differentiate right now. But all our MOOCs also carry credentials, all our bite-sized courses also carry credentials. So we have our upskilling and reskilling program to train our lecturers to develop online program, online courses. And then this is where we are heading right now. The curriculum framework. Similar to Korea, we have, we need to have, the university needs to be convinced that, you know, whatever we are doing is being accepted by accreditation body. So this is what, at national level, we came up with the Excel curriculum framework. This framework, they have actually four trusts. Number one is ideal, it is industry-based curriculum. Number two is care, it is community-based learning curriculum. Number three is real, um, research-based curriculum. So they have certain um, number of hours when in their academic program that they do research. And the one that is related to MOOCs and micro-credential is POIS, which is Personalized Experiential Learning Framework. So in this curriculum POIS framework, this is what happened. You can spend up to 
40 credits. Let's say we have we need 120 credits in one academic program. You can spend up to 40 credits exploring any areas. Like for example, I am someone who did not immediately further my study after my secondary school education. So I spend sometimes um, working, for example, then after some time, then I still do not know what I want to do. What do I want to study? So you can explore up to 40 credits in the academic program to search for, you know, I want to take a little, some courses related to engineering, some courses related to arts and something else. You can spend up to 40 credits and we call that as passion driven. And then you can, after you found, after you have found what you are passionate about, and then you can continue the rest of the uh, credit credits in that track. You can also have compet uh, competency driven and mastery driven. So this is the framework. But this is not yet, I, I think we have one academic degree program that is such as this, that use such framework. So where, where micro credential and MOOCs came into place is that you can do this exploration through MOOCs or micro credential. Take any courses that you want from all over the world and then gather that into 40 credits. So you do not have to, you know, take all the 40 credits from the university courses. You can take that from MOOCs, from micro credential, from wherever, and then transfer, apply for, transfer credit in this curriculum structure. And then maybe you take the rest of the credits based on face-to-face -face learning, maybe in university, after you have done your aspiration. And the same thing goes to all the other levels. So this is just a, the, the framework. And then the MOOC credit transfer. In Malaysia, you can apply for MOOC credit transfer up to 30% of your graduating credits. However, on top of this 30% credit transfer, you can also transfer up to another 30% of credit transfer through your prior working experience. So in all, you can transfer up to 60% of credits when you want to apply for a degree. 30% through fast track MOOC credit transfer, another 30% through your working experience. So that is about 60%. You can apply up to 60% of credit transfer. So you spend very little time at your university another 40 percent for to graduate so this is where in this document it is stated here and I'm maybe if I have if we have time I'm going to share how my university is implementing this we have um, 14 students applied for credit transfer through, through MOOCs we have generated some income through this credit transfer process because it is no longer government-led initiative because it is funded by university itself. So we, I think we have earned about 6,000 uh, USD uh, from the processes because when students, what students have to do is that they learn through MOOCs and then they come to the faculty, they fill in a form and then the head of the department will take the form uh, and look at the certificate and the CLO, they have to provide the 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 cost on the outcome and all and then the head of the department will send this document if they do not have the experts at their faculty they will send this document to my center and my center will look for ex related experts to authenticate students knowledge acquired in that MOOC so we have a second assessment for the student to test whether the authenticity of the person um, taking the course. So this is what we do. And then how they apply for credit transfer, they have to um, pass a minimum grade for postgraduate is B minus, uh, and, and this grade is not, is not calculated in their need, we just calculated uh, uh, their credits. 
So uh, if they pass this grade and then they will be granted the credits. So how we calculate the similarity is based on number one, 80% similarity of cost on the outcome and 80% similarity of content. So that is how we do it. And then these are the processes. I think I'll be sharing this slide. So this is the MOOC credits transfer process that we have at our university. So they obtain the certificate, apply for credit transfer, evaluate the application uh, if they are eligible and then they can they will go through all these processes they have to pay for a fee and one credit um, the, the, the payment is based on number of credits so this is what we do at our university um, and then these are the other actions that we do through MOOCs and the nearest one or our very nearest project with um, Ministry of Higher Education is this hybrid learning guidelines by hybrid, we mean that you are teaching physical and online at the same time. So we are currently developing the hybrid learning guidelines um, to accommodate more for students at remote as well as physical. I think um, the rest of the rest of it, I think I have uh, I have shared with them. Um, the rest of it, I think we will have this uh, slide later on because the time is up. So thank you very much. That's all from me. I think there should be some questions from the floor. This presentation is, of course, oh wow, very interesting indeed. So now, any comments or questions, please? Okay, Madam Chancellor, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. As always, uh, I'm delighted to hear the national policies that yeah. really govern and really enable uh, our universities to offer uh, these uh, courses um, in, in the context of your educational ecosystem. I'm interested in the process of authenticating. Uh, mm -hmm. So when you are applying for uh, the, the credit transfer, mm -hmm. you mentioned the le two levels of uh, authentication of the, uh, the, the achievement of the learning outcomes of the student uh, mm -hmm. applying for credit transfer. So. Uh, how, how exactly is the process of authentication? Is it just a, a, an authentication of the certificate that is being presented? Especially when we talk of the micro-credentialing, we're always talking of this um, proof that you have earned yeah, yeah, and achieved the learning outcome. So how, how is the authentication process being done? Thank you. Okay, um, so when um, we receive the application from the students, so, so the students will bring their certificate along with the uh, cost learning outcome from the platform that they were learning. Uh -huh. And then these forms will be evaluated by the head of the department. And then we will see, for example, they want to apply for credit transfer for the subject dynamics of leadership. Uh -huh. And these dynamics of leadership, um, let's say it is not offered. We have no experts on dynamics of leadership in faculty of engineering. So we take Faculty will take this form and send to the center of the university uh -huh. and then university will look for the experts and appoint an expert to build assessment questions. Okay. So th there is an assessment? Yes, okay. there is an assessment. Okay. So the assessment can be in the form of interview, uh -huh. can be in the form of pencils and pen paper Exam, test, yeah. uh -huh. can be in the form of portfolio and there are many other forms okay. um, that is up to the expert to um, to decide mm -hmm. what kind of assessment that they want to carry out to assess the student. Yeah, so it is the assessment process that is being paid for. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That is the process being paid for. Okay, Professor Jintoui. Yes, I, I try to think and compare with you know like what we are doing here. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think like we have something very um, in common that. For Thai we have certificate level one, which is they receive it online mm -hmm. and consider it as the certificate of um, completion just to complete the course. Yeah. So same, right? So level two, yeah. we call the certificate of achievement, achievement. Yeah. that need to have the assessment. Yeah. But for you, it's maybe uh, more open that the assessment can be in any form. Yes. Depends on the expert in that field. That's very interesting point, yes. I think. But we also declare uh, in our form 
if you take your course from a very well-known platform in which that platform has the authentication mm-hmm. way of assessing student mm-hmm. in which they have this proctoring system mm-hmm. like for example Coursera mm-hmm. then you can be exempted mm-hmm. from going through okay. this assessment we did have that clause in our guidelines so it also depends because the panel of reviewers will be checking Mm-hmm. Uh, the platform so the, the students have to write uh, from which platform do they take this course okay. so this is quite different than KMOOCs in which that we were we are going to say that all all MOOC courses can be academic bearing can be credit bearing courses mm-hmm. yeah. it depends on the university whether you want to accept that MOOCs or not mm-hmm. so we do not declare any courses as credit bearing or not mm-hmm. but of course when we develop courses we we have a specific way of developing we have the course on the outcome we we have that kind of processes to make sure that it is transferable to other universities but we do not declare any courses as a credit bearing courses because we literally accept anything in the world mm-hmm. can be applied for credit transfer it depends on the receiving university to accept and it is based on 80% sim- content yeah, similarity yeah, yeah, yeah. and 80% of CLO similarity yeah. with the mm-hmm. courses that they want to apply for credit for credit transfer may I further ask like uh, the, 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 the accreditation that you're talking is at the university level yes right yes because it depends on the students where they are enrolling I mean, yeah yeah uh-huh. where they are graduating yes so another question related to that mm-hmm. how about the experience transfer the, the one that you're talking about accumulate around 30 percent how how it works i mean um well the 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 similarity the similarity wise assessment of similarity is done by the expert that we figure from from the application let's say for example just now the subject is dynamics of leadership so we will find within our university who has this kind of expert of expertise and then they will evaluate with the existing courses related to leadership how is that similar with the MOOC that is being taken by these students so this expert is being appointed and being paid to analyze the 80 percent similarity so it is down to this expert evaluation yes okay. that is being paid for wow oh, that is very interesting and uh, dr Pongtawat, please uh, so last comment please as a student i found it's very very interesting that uh, i can apply anything for for credit so this is uh, very open and very interesting so I would like to know, as a student, how can I know uh, what 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 should I take? For example, if I aim to 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 transfer credit for some of your degree courses, so there's so many moves around. So is there any guideline or something that, uh, as a student, and what 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 is the plan on what the course on what uh, what what should I do? Something like that. Okay. Um, what would be ideal, and that is. Um what would be ideal is that if a university or if an academic program owner can list down the selection of MOOC courses that can be applied for credit transfer that is 80% similar with the existing academic program but that did not happen yet at our university uh, that would be an ideal case so so when you ask this question we can give you this pamphlet okay these are the thousands of courses so it is we we know that it is 80 percent 80 percent similar so my answer would be that for now any courses will do you just maybe what you can do is that you look at the university academic program the name of the courses maybe that might help and then you look for any online courses that has maybe similar title then you take that but of course the risk is that you have to spend money in a way that you know I thought this is this is 80% similar but it turns out it is not 80% similar 
that problem might arise. But you can consult the faculty first before you want to enroll. That is what you can do, at least. Okay, that is clear. So thank you so much. And um, I think we learned a lot from this morning. We start with a bang. We carry on with a bang, bang, bang. And we end up this morning session with a big, big bang. Everything we learned today give us really, um, I would say, future hope that our education will transform into a better place. Uh, with this, please join me to give her a big hand. Thank you so much. And may I please invite Professor Dr. Jin Wee to present token of appreciation, please. Oops. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to finish our morning session, and as I mentioned before, we will come back with the Philippines and Thailand. Now for lunch, if you leave this room, don't forget to collect your lunch pass. This is a coupon, yellow color. You will proceed to the right-hand side on this floor. Keep walking, and then you will see a room called Pikun Gel. We are going to have lunch over there. Once again, get your yellow coupon and proceed to Pikun Gao restaurant on this floor. Thank you. See you at 1 p.m. Thank you. 1 p.m. Uh, how about 1.15? You are belonging here, but I recommend you to bring all your
ทดสอบทดสอบเช็คเช็ค
Good afternoon, dear participants. Let our afternoon session begin. So far this morning, we heard many interesting presentations start from AUN perspective. Then we listen presentations from Indonesia, from Republic of Korea, and from Malaysia. I believe that we have learned a lot from our speakers this morning. Still, we have two more countries to present, and it is my honor and a pleasure to introduce you very first speaker for this afternoon. We have Professor Dr. Melinda de la Pena Banalalia, Chancellor and Professor, University of the Philippines, Open Universities of the Philippines. I have known Madam Chancellor for I think 10 years. I can tell you that I have always learned a lot from her. So many things uh, that she created or she initiated and we can follow. So I believe that this session would be very interesting. And uh, without any further delay, let me invite Madam Chancellor on the stage. So please, thank you. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Michael. I hope I will not disappoint you this time. So uh, after that uh, very good lunch, I think uh, uh, um, for most of us, the next best thing is for us to go to sleep. <laughs> anyway, I hope I will not make you sleepy through this presentation. So uh, I titled uh, my presentation this afternoon, Transforming Higher Education Through MOOC. Uh, discourses that shape the 10 years of Philippine journey. You know, when I was preparing this presentation, I just realized na that, hey, uh, we've been doing this for 10 years already, this 2023. So, uh, and um, uh, all those 10 years, throughout those 10 years, there were many questions that, um, um, that were the focus of our discussions when it comes to MOOC, and in a way, or should I say, they really shape the way we implement, we implemented and has been implementing our MOOCs until now at the university level. So um, um, as mentioned, um, I'm from the UP Open University and I'm also now actively involved at the uh, ICDE, bo uh, both as a board member and as ambassador of Open Educational Resources. So I can say that uh, uh, the things that I'm also doing for OER is also part of my work uh, for ICDE, okay? So the context of this presentation, of course, um, is to provide you a glimpse of the structure of the chapter in the book that we are conceptualizing. And I really thank, uh, of course, Professor Paulina, our colleagues uh, who are with us in this group uh, for giving me this opportunity, for, for, for inviting me to be part of the group uh, who will be working on this. And of course, uh, the opportunity to present uh, the Philippine MOOC initiative. So. Uh, well, actually, um, it is un unlike the other presentations or unlike the other MOOC initiative, uh, for the Philippines, it's really a university-led um, initiative. And um, probably that will somehow make the difference. But I can say that uh, I can anchor, we can anchor at the Philippine MOOC initiative to the, to the initiative of my university because there was this um, one material that I found that in published in 2013 uh, wherein one of the discussions uh, mentioned something about are there other are there Philippine schools offering MOOC, and that was in June 2013. And uh, the expert who was being interviewed mentioned that there's none at present, but uh, uh, there are there are already announcements that the UP Open University would launch their MOOC uh, this year, and that was 2013. Okay, so. Just to give you a, a, a brief background uh, about my university, because it really matters on how we conceptualize uh, our MOOC. Uh, we are one of the constituent units of the University of the Philippines system, and we are the only national university in the country. So this aspect, this matter, contributed a lot to how we shape our massive open online courses. We were established in 1995 with a mandate to democratize access to quality higher education through distance education. So. 
We've been doing uh, online learning, distance e-learning, starting in 2001, and we became fully online in 2007. So uh, it's more than, uh, more than five years that uh, we have experienced doing online learning when we started uh, doing our MOOC in 2013. And we also have a mandate from our government to help other higher education institutions who are interested to do open distance learning, and we, we are actively participating in many international organizations, especially those uh, which are involved in quality um, assurance for online learning. So these are the discourses that shape the Philippine MOOC journey. So at the very start, at the very start, uh, we were looking for that model wherein we can really strengthen our public service function. So as a public service university, we are engaged or doing three major functions, instruction, research, and public service. So, but because we are a fully online university, we are doing distance education program, we cannot do what the other traditional or conventional, conventional universities are doing when it comes to delivering their public service um, uh, function. So I was reminded um, uh, during our lunch conversation, we're in uh, the one in Korea, <laughs> You, you now have to be engaged with your local community. So uh, engaging with the local community has been part of our mandate, but not, not to that extent. So it's, it's there, and we should find a model by which we can have this function and uh, implement this function um, effectively. So we are an open university, we are a fully online university, and of course we are a state-funded university. So we have to find a model. How can we implement our public service function given this basic or uh, characteristics or features of our university? Okay? So that's the first question. What public service, how can we do our public service function? And that's where MOOC came in. So I happened to be engaged, or I happened to start participating in MOOC in 2008. And uh, in 2011, uh, I attended um, an ICDE conference, and that's where I got to uh, listen to um, a resource person talking about MOOCs, open educational resources, etc., etc. So at the time, at the university, we were already talking about that. So MOOC as a framework, as an open online course, is somehow suited or very appropriate to who we are as a public service university. So that's the first question. The second question, why develop our own MOOC when there are many providers already? And this, the MOOCs are coming from big universities. So why, why do we have to do it? Uh, it's not as if we don't have anything to do. We have so many things to do. So why add this to the, to the burden, to the workload of our faculty at the time in 2012, the top three MOOC providers, Udacity, Coursera, edX, and these are these three providers were anchored on big universities. So how, how can we compete? How can we compete with, with these big universities? So at the time when we um, look closely at this question, the answer to this question, we also came up with the imperatives for offering the Philippine MOOCs. So one, we have to have a focus on specific uh, groups as our target learners. Unlike other MOOCs, where anyone, anyone, it's not focused on anything, but uh, the focus is the learning outcomes. But in order for us to really identify what learning outcomes do, re do we really want to see among those completers of our MOOCs, then we have to really identify specific groups as our target learners and um, design the learning outcomes or identify learning outcomes based on what these target groups uh, or target learners would, um, would need. So at the time, we already identified it should be a continuing education, lifelong learning, especially for our teachers who really need that. Support to industry, like the business process outsourcing uh, industry, which is a big thing in the Philippines, a big contributor uh, to our economy. It can also be a support to, to specific advocacy. So like, for instance, uh, we partnered with UNICEF to develop MOOCs on child rights protection and promotion. And uh, because um, even child trafficking is very rampant in the Philippines, and we know that uh, somehow we should do our share uh, and contribute to addressing that particular concern. And of course, improve or build the skills and competencies of the overseas Filipino workers and also the out-of-school youth. So at the start, 
even from the, from the start that we've been doing uh, MOOC, we have identified these groups as our target learners. So when we look at the data, so um, we, we have this data that something like, uh, if, if there are 100 um, students who start grade one, that's the first level for the basic education, um, only 14 would complete the college degree. And uh, so what would happen to the dropout? Somehow there has to be learning opportunities for them. Um, and um, in, in, during that time, from 2013 to 2015, uh, there was an estimated 3.6 million out-of-school youth. Um, and 83.1% of them were at that age of 16 to 24, which can be uh, the target, uh, one of the target groups for our MOOCs. And of course, um, for, for our OFWs, uh, so that we can prepare them for their re reintegration to the Philippines. In 2013, it was also estimated that there were 2.3 million overseas Filipino workers, and somehow they're, they, they're, we should provide them with learning opportunities. So, um, so we have developed uh, many MOOCs uh, to respond to the needs of these learners. And in 2017, we also started offering the MOOC certification courses. So we have MOOC certi this These certification courses are group of MOOCs, modules, something like that. And when you complete the learning activities, the capstone requirement, then you will be given a certification for that particular skill. So like for instance, for teacher, uh, teaching in open distance e-learning, uh, that can be a certification, child rights uh, protection and promotion, Technology for Teaching and Learning comprised of three MOOCs. Um, we have also for Sustainable Development and so on and so forth. So these are some examples. We have a certification for Business Analytics uh, as well. So, so why develop our own MOOCs? Another imperative is we have to help improve the quality of education by providing free content for the credit courses that are being offered by many HEIs. We call this model MOOCs as OER. So, I think at the time, we call it unbundling of courses, which is now one strategy for micro-credentialing. At the time, what we have in mind was micro-credentialing, unbundling of courses, because you would also unbundle the cost of education. So what we did was for every three units, um, every three unit course, then we will develop three MOOCs, and one MOOC is equivalent to uh, one unit credit. Um, so there's no more problem about content equivalency because the content of the MOOC um, would be a pattern or obtained after what was approved by the Ministry of Higher Education. We call it the Commission on Higher Education. So there is already the perfect um, comparison in terms of the content of the MOOCs that we have developed and the credit courses that are being offered by the higher education institution. So one example here is the business analytics and the courses offered for the BPO uh, industry. So um, it is also a response. At the time, we, we've been 2015, 2016, we were talking about the Paris message and the projection of higher education by 2030, the needs for higher education in 2030. And there is no way conventional universities would be able to respond uh, to the needs. So they are encouraging um, the, uh, the universities to really consider online learning, which will include massive open online courses. So we have started that, and we believe that at least for the Philippines and somehow in Asia, we would be able to respond to the needs for higher education by 2030. So it is also a response to the needs of the industry. We have been talking about upscaling, reskilling, lifelong learning because of this um, uh, development in the needs of the industry. When we were talking about the fourth industrial revolution, which started in 2016, and there was also the discussion about the fifth industrial revolution, which started in 2019. Somehow, uh, the world of work is changing very fast, and universities will have to respond. Unfortunately, changing our curriculum is not that fast. I mean, we cannot do it that fast. Uh, I think earlier it was mentioned that right now the industry is so patient with us, but until when will they be patiently waiting for us to respond to what they need in terms of their manpower requirement? So the immediate response can be through MOOC, and that is wh when we can really provide the reskilling, upskilling opportunities for our uh, manpower or the, the, the pool of the manpower needs of the industry. 
Of course, uh, we've heard a lot about the gig economy, and MOOCs can also provide gig learning opportunity for our gig wo workers. So the Philippines is sixth in the world as the fastest growing market. Uh, this was based on um, a, a 2019 survey on Global Gig Economy Index. And somehow, in order for this um, sector, our gig workers, to stay in the market, they have to continue scaling and upscaling as well. So again, MOOCs can provide for that learning opportunity to this group of workers and professionals. So the next question, so, so that, that's what we've been doing since 2013 up to 2019 and then there came the pandemic in 2020 so at that time um we, we were all thinking so what what's the how, how can we respond to the needs of our fellow educators we are the fully online university we are a state university and somehow we have a responsibility to help the country's education sector transition to remote emergency remote uh, teaching and that's when we also use the MOOC as a strategy for inclusive, massive, and rapid training for teachers and school administrators. So during that time, starting in March 2020, we developed or we implemented this model of training, inclusive training, wherein we combined, we combined webinar sessions plus MOOC. So we, we observed that uh, even if you have so many materials, recorded lectures, etc., for the different topics that our teachers would need, they would still ask for a live lecture. Even if it's just a video uh, conferencing, they would ask for that. And we, we identified that as a craving for synchronicity. So we, we, we still implement, uh, implemented the webinar sessions. Um, and then, but somehow, we have to make sure that they have learned um, the lesson, etc. And there should be the completion of the learning activities, which will be the basis uh, for the certification that they would get after completing the training program. So webinar plus MOOC, where the learning activities are done, where they, where, where they can go back to the content, to the lesson, to the recorded webinar sessions, and where interaction can happen. So uh, the design of the MOOCs uh, should make sure that there will be the learner-learner, learner content, and the learner-teacher interaction, and that is being provided by the MOOC, okay? So this is the comparison uh, for the pre-COVID. So you can see it's not really massive if you will look at it, uh, but during the, the, the time of the pandemic, uh, we were able to see a significant increase in the number of those who are enrolling in our MOOCs. So question number four, how can we ensure the quality of the Philippine MOOCs? So um, even at that time, we started looking at the different quality frameworks uh, for MOOCs. So we have this uh, uh, open up uh, ed, a quality label uh, derived from the e-excellence label for e-learning in higher education. So we can look at those different uh, frameworks, QA frameworks for open online learning. COL also has something uh, for MOOC. And if we will compare the parameters for these two frameworks, we can see that somehow uh, they, they are similar and we can, we can learn from these different frameworks which we can integrate into our MOOC so that we can make sure that um, they are of quality courses. I also, um, a few years ago, I also developed my own framework in search of a really a, a QA framework for MOOC. So I have this, which is somehow also um, comparable to uh, what has been published. So uh, infrastructure, teaching stuff, the design of learning, etc., evaluation, and of course, assessment. And um, I, I happened to come across this um, World University Rankings by MOOC Performance. I'm not really advocating for this, uh, but somehow we can look at the performance indicators that they are using to evaluate universities, so the number of MOOCs, course programs, bearing credit, etc., etc. So we can also look at it uh, if we want to consider QA frameworks for our MOOCs. So how can we sustain? So what are the sustainability models? 
So in our case, what we did was to put in place, we, we still don't have any national policy on MOOC, unlike Malaysia, Indonesia, Korea, Philippines doesn't have yet any national policy. So what the best that we could do is have institutional policies, wherein we can assign work credit for those who will be developing MOOCs and coordinate the course offering. We consider, this, we are not yet implementing this uh, certification for a fee, partner with industry, research funds, and top the CSR funds of companies and organizations who are interested to work with us. So what, where do we want to bring the Philippine MOOCs? So we really want to see learning in the future through MOOCs. So uh, we have observed and we have to capitalize on the gains that were made for online learning during the COVID-19 pandemic. Somehow even our learners are looking for that kind of flexibility uh, and uh, agility in terms of how they would be learning or uh, getting their degree um, in the future. So integrate micro-credentialing. MOOC should be integrated with micro-credentialing, the stackable credits. We've been talking about this transfer credit since this morning. And somehow we have to combine this um, a transfer credit, stackable credits with the MOOCs framework. Um, continue with our MOOC certification program. Um, partner with industry so that we can really say that what we are offering as our MOOCs and micro-credential courses would be relevant to the needs of the industry. This is something that we've been campaigning since uh, 2017 for us to integrate the basic features of the universal design for learning for a more inclusive learning opportunity. And of course, uh, we need to promote the MOOC as OER model, the unbundled, unbundled courses, etc., for quality education and uh, for a more agile and flexible education ecosystem. Integrate adoption for the QA framework, promote webinar plus MOOC model. And of course, for additional sustainability model, this is something that uh, we hope we can experiment also, or also try doing. Mo uh, MOOC as a, like a Netflix, wherein learners would subscribe uh, uh, to learning opportunities just like what they're doing for Netflix. So learning by subscription. Um, and we need to strengthen our MOOCs uh, through AI and analytics-driven strategies so that uh, we can really increase the completion rate and reduce the faculty labor, considering the number of enrollees that we are having in our MOOC. So, but beware of the pitfalls of MOOCs for higher education. We're not doing it just to join the bandwagon because this is the current, I mean, the, the conversation that is happening now. Failing to interrogate the whys and the hows and the what's of doing MOOCs is something that uh, is a very big uh, pitfall on our part. And uh, we should not be limited to what the leading MOOC providers are doing. We should be able to craft our own model based on our context and based on what our learners are doing. And of course, there is always the kind of perspective wherein we measure the success indicators by the number or the rate of completion. Somehow we have to bear away from the completion. I, I am of that perspective that once they are enrolled in your MOOC, even if they will not complete the MOOC, they will be able to learn something from your course. So that's learning by itself and somehow through analytics, probably how, how we were able to engage them, even without completing the course, we know that they learned something from our courses. So I think this is my last slide. Thank you very much for listening. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Madam Chancellor. You never let me down. Okay, <laughs> never <you>. ever. <laughs> okay, we learned a great deal from the Philippines. As she mentioned, she touched officially on MOOC since 2008. 20, no, I, I, I participated. Oh, participated. But the, but the university started offering in 2013. Okay. Yeah. After, after so much deliberation. <laughs> but uh, if we remember, the, the year of MOOC officially it's, launched 2008. So yeah. this is very original case. Yeah. So she has a lot of experience to share with us. Uh, so any questions from the floor, please? Oh my. OK, now <laughs> Tavani ha has the microphone, please, Professor Thank Tavani. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so appreciate on your presentation. I have found a lot of the progress of the Philippine Open University MOOC courses. So is it possible that you can transfer that experience from the 
OPU to the whole country of Philippines? Yeah, I, I can say that um, this, this journey uh, that the university had undertaken for the MOOC uh, can be the same or can be considered as the same as the journey for the Philippines because I think until now, uh, it is only the UPOU has been offering work at that, at that extent. But what we're hoping to do really is to encourage uh, encourage other universities to do as well, and we are currently helping them, especially those who are already offering programs in the online mode. So we have, we have um, th there is this system of accreditation in the country uh, so that you can offer your programs in the distance education mode. So we have this Republic Act 10650, the Open Distance Learning Law. Uh, so earlier there was a discussion, what percentage of the course and the program uh, should be in the distance education mode for you to be considered as under that mode of delivery. So in the Philippines, uh, we follow the same. It should not exceed 50%. So that, that's the more recent um, uh, policy issue ones of our Commission on Higher Education. So if you go beyond uh, 50%, then you have to seek accreditation from the Commission on Higher Education. Um, and th th they will really look, they will really evaluate you, your course materials, even the training of your teachers, even the learning management system, if you will declare your university to be an online provider of uh, programs. Not, not, not the generation one distance education, but the more uh, modern uh, way of doing distance education wherein uh, online learning is integrated into it. Yeah. I hope that it is your big hand for the whole country in the near future. <laughs> Thank yeah, we you. Have, we have to do that. We have to really influence uh, because somehow that is a mandate of our university being the only national university of the country. So we are expected to do that. And in that law that I have cited, the Open Distance Learning Act, the UP Open University was really mandated to help other higher education institutions. So we, we, we have to do that. Otherwise, uh, we, will, we will not be doing our mandate as, as an open university. So there's, there's a big responsibility attached to it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions or comments, please? OK. If not, please um, join me to give her a loud of applause. Thank you very Thank much. You very Thank much. you. And uh, may I ask, invite uh, Associate Professor Dr. Tapani Tameta to present a uh, gift of appreciation, please. Thank you, Madam Chancellor. Ladies and gentlemen, so far we listened to presentation from AUN, from Indonesia, from Korea, from Malaysia, from the Philippines, and now it is time for the host, Thailand. So on the stage now we have Associate Professor Dr. Tapani Tameta. Director of Thailand Cyber University Project and Professor Dr. Jintawi Klai Sang, Deputy Director of Thailand Cyber University Project. They are going to share with us experience and perspective based on the journey of Thai MOOC. So without any delay, please welcome them with a big hand. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And good afternoon, everyone. So I'm so glad that we can host this expert meeting. And actually, we have done, all of the presenter have done uh, in November last year. Why didn't it, this is a good start of our community. So for today, our responsibility, uh, Jin and I go together to like the present for our history and our present and the future of our Thai MOOC, the Thai MOOC platform. Actually, I'm older than her, so that I choose start for our history. In 2005, before I worked with the TCU project, uh, the, the, 
this project is under the Ministry of Education in the past and under the Office of the Higher Education Commission. But now they, we turn to be the under of uh, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Higher Education in short. For the long name, I forgot some, some of the short, uh, we call only the Messi, right? In 2005, uh, that time, the OHEC also announced of the e-education uh, policy strategy. This under the ICT policy, under the Ministry of uh, Information and Technology, something like that. So this long story. At that time, TCU also uh, like the provide the TCU LMS for all Thai university, this free of charge of the learning management system. At that time, we have to encourage people know what is the e-learning, what is the online education. It's a story. After that, we got the annual budget from the government, and every year we also transfer this budget to the university who commit to produce the course where we also provide, we also call that this is open course where under the Ministry of Education. At that time, we also um, claim that our platform, our TCUMS, uh, we also provide like the 800 courses. Most of courses is for the undergrad student and especially for the university level. And people, other people can access for this platform because it's really easy just to uh, register to be our uh, member and that they can access for free of charge. Mm -hmm. And in 2015, uh, we also claim that our courses is an uh, open Courseware, mm -hmm. and in currently that time, after the uh, pet, after the online education allowed the, the world, especially for the uh, ASEAN, for the European and the United States of America, they also announced that they're gonna start with the more open, massive open online courses at that time. We also start for, we also turn for our experience from open courseware to be massive open course. At that time in, luckily we got the huge budget from the Ministry of Information and Technology. Mm -hmm. We gonna start from open course, open courseware to be Thai, massive open courseware in 2015. From the past until now, we have, right now, we, in our platform, also provide 500 courses. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, at that, uh, during the COVID-19, we, we are like, uh, our, our number that's access from our platform, 1.5 million yes. of the member. Mm -hmm. This is our story, just in short. So uh, after that, when we also start from the Thai MOOC platform, and we also provide too many, many strategy. We also continue our same strategy in the past when we provide the TCU LMS. This is also a platform just to uh, ask the university, also university network come together to provide the content to be our user, our platform. Mm -hmm. And then also the expand opportunity for this courseware to the Thai people. And actually for the Every year we have done a lot of the research and development, not only for the academic research, but also for the system. 
example like uh, how to like the uh, customize our uh, credit bank system Thai Mook credit bank system our test bank system and also everything so in this room we uh, get together with the the expert from mm. from some university no no not the same some from many university allowed the country come together not only for the content the provide the content but also for provide the system after uh, finish uh, this presentation we gonna set for the loud table mm -hmm. sitting and sharing the idea and also discuss for collaboration okay Ajahn Jin, shall we go it fast because I would love <laughs> to see also the photo and actually <laughs> this is a uh, uh, Professor Anushai model that also provide like the national digital learning platform for lifelong learning. We also set the one people that uh, the journey of the uh, like the, the learning, jo journey. learning journey mm -hmm. like the, we're gonna start from uh, the people example like the like the student mm -hmm. they also drop if they drop out from the school they can do to. Uh, they can keep like the the time in the future for for like the study via MOOC courses that an example like the other people when they like the work at the the workplace they can learn that then they can learn from the MOOC platform they can collect the credit in the future mm -hmm. for the future mm -hmm. and the student who study in the university level they can use that courses the MOOC courses and keep that on the university credit bank or the Thai MOOC credit bank and actually when they finish that their university level they can when they graduate already they went to the workplace they can learn for the professional development and they can like the get the uh, degree they can call that they can lead skill and up skill for their level and that time is someone is nearly retired like me and actually I can access for the MOOC courses and continue our education we will call a lifelong learning from the MOOC platform so this is like the learning journey of the one people when they use our Thai MOOC credit back I MOOC uh, for our studying, for their studying, mm -hmm. they can keep that the credit, mm -hmm. like the study from our credit bank platform. And actually for the credit bank platform, we can claim that we will do like the prototype for the national, Thai national credit bank system in the future because we are all the mem the committee of the member of this project mm -hmm. for the whole country and actually <laughs> actually Ajahn Tai you can <laughs> continue my <laughs> presentation okay cut. and I, I will ask you actually Ajahn Tai for the Thai MOOC category why then we got for the 12 11 11 or 12 Mm -hmm. We will call the 12 category. Mm -hmm. Why don't we set 12 category for uh, the Thai MOOC? These 12 categories are from the, um, the global trends mm -hmm. that um, we first explore like the what kind of MOOC courses for the uh, global trend point of view and then we also match with um, our country strategy and mission. Mm -hmm. So is come to these 12 categories that are um, seem that is to be indebted by the university and to serve the concept of lifelong learning. And actually we also provide this one for the, uh, like the directly in the directly. future. Yes, yes. So our upcoming um, project is going to be the um, cooperation that we talking about, um, like what, I think like other countries also feel the same thing that um, each MOOC platform have their own mm -hmm. contents. So why don't we uh, make it shareable, uh, maybe at the back end, mm -hmm. so to expand the 
uh, content collections of each MOOC platform. So that's why we start to categorize our content into 12 categories. So it can be further uh, talk about uh, further collaborations. Mm -hmm. And so easy for our, that we can collect our courses, like the 500 courses mm -hmm. that really easy to access, right? And actually for our MOOC platform, we also provide the most, the, the, the top, most, three, the top categories. three, yeah. Yes. The first one is like the computer and technology. Mm -hmm. It's normal for, because of a lot of our university would love to open this, uh, like the ICT content. Right, yeah. right. And the second, uh, second uh, is the business and management, followed by education and training. So this top three categories uh, are the most popular, mm. I would say, and um, in response with the, our country policies. So uh, these three categories are the uh, first three uh, categories that we plan to do the micro credentials. Yeah. So that the, the result from, you know, like um, the need of the global trend and also the our countries. So um, this showed uh, the MOOC platform that um, the director Tapani mentioned, and she just made me very impressed that she made the 15 year history of TCU presented in 10 minutes. <laughs> Five very minutes, impressive right? yeah <laughs> okay so um what's next we're going to talking about our current and future uh, of um time mooc um based on that grounded concept of we plan to um position time mooc as the national digital learning platform focusing on lifelong learning so we not only provide the mooc content uh, for our platform, what we also plan to expand uh, our platform uh, to serve the concept of lifelong learning. So that's why the um, the learning profile and the credit bank system uh, need to be extended as our uh, extension of our platform. So um, the ecosystem of Time MOOC, uh, like what I mentioned earlier, is not going to be only the MOOC courses. Uh, but we also um, talking about um, MOOC course directories that with the collaboration with other MOOC platform, we can expand our content, not only us, but other MOOCs that uh, partner with us can also, mm -hmm. um, you know, like share the content together. Um, the other, eco uh, other element for our ecosystem is the roaming account because um, we would like to uh, expand the number of um, users who use our system. So by um, developing the roaming account, learners who already have the account from the universities um, can also use the TimeMook directory or our um, TimeMook partners with one single ID. So that the concept uh, to make it easy access to the content. And um, also to make it happen for the lifelong learning concept, we also develop the, uh, the subsystem uh, with the e-profile, which is the, to collect the data and learning records for a lifetime. So it's going to be not only support the uh, uh, when they are the student in the university, but it's also support them for the job application. And um, the next is going to be the e-testing, which is the standard learning assessment lead to the self-development. So um, after learners learn from Taimu platform, they will receive like level one certificate, which is the certificate of um, completion so that they just complete and that certificate verify them. But uh, the next step in order to make it um, um, accredit, be able to accredit and accumulate into the credit bank system, we have one subsystem called e-testing to be sure that um, they really qualify uh, and complete on that course. So we call it uh, if the learner uh, go through the e-testing uh, system is going to be they will receive the certificate we call level two which is the certificate of achievement so meaning that they really achieve the learning outcomes 
and then those will accumulate and later be transferred uh, via our credit bank system that uh, the director mentioned that is uh, going to be a sandbox for the national credit bank system. Yeah, and actually our engineer is also here, Dr. Phong Thawat, so give a big hand to him, <laughs> please. <laughs> He's our, uh, our key person to support, you know, like all of this system along with the uh, Time Move team. So, <laughs> um, so Ajahn Phong Thuat, if you have any, uh, anything would like to mention, please. Mm -hmm. And actually for this uh, ecosystem, we not use, we not only use for the online, but also some parts of the e test. Mm -hmm. We can use like the on-site mm -hmm. sample, like yeah. the we we set like the testing testing center, sen center yeah. from all Partner the with the yeah. university who have many campuses right. throughout the country. Mm -hmm. We so also think of the branded way, the branded learning. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So uh, from that eco learning ecosystem, uh, this uh, this slide present the user journey. So talking about if you are the user here, and then uh, the first step you will uh, go to the identify, uh, identity provider with the, um, the system will support this identity provider for the roaming account that I mentioned earlier. And then after that, they will go to the MOOC cost directory, which later if we have more partners, both um, at the national and international level is we'll expand our um, content collections. Um, and then after that, learners will go to the learning management system, the MOOC platform uh, provider. Uh, they will receive uh, the certificate level one, which is the cert certificate of um, completion. And then uh, they need to uh, another option is that they can go to the e-testing in order to get the certificate level two, uh, which will be later keep in the credit bank system and also the credential wallet. So those uh, will, with the, uh, all of these, it will generate the digital transcript record and uh, be able to use among the universities with uh, our partner with us, with the Macy. And Ajantai, actually for all Thai university now, they also provide their own like the credit, credit bank, bank system. system. Yeah, according to our announcement and regulation of the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research and um, Innovation, uh, just came out last year with the uh, announcement, regulation, and guideline. Uh, there are three important and uh, related to you know like what we are doing here. First is the um, announcement about the information technology management in higher education came out October last year. This one is very similar to um, the the Malaysian. Um, announcement about, you know, like how can we differentiate the branded learning program with the online learning program. So uh, for Malaysia, uh, what I recall you use the, uh, for the curriculum level, you use 80% to differentiate, right? For us, we use 60%. And for the cost level, we are same with Malaysia with this 60% online. So uh, this announcement, uh, actually, uh, the director, she's the, the chair of um, you know, this announcement to produce this um, announcement and regulation uh, for the Macy. So um, this one, uh, we try to differentiate the regular uh, curriculum and program, the face-to-face -face one or the branded learning one with the, um, the program one that focus on the information technology management. The name may be different, but I think the concept is the same. Try to differentiate uh, the two types of the programs or the curriculum. Yeah. Um, the second announcement that related to um, our MOOCs or the online learning is about the credit bank and credit transfer, credit accumulation operation came out September last year. 
So these two announcements and regulation really open up the learning opportunity for Thai citizens, really. And um, like what um, the AUN director mentioned this morning, like um, the bottom line is uh, whatever what whatever mode of learning learners attend or participate, but uh, the core concept is the learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. So in this announcement, they focus on the learning outcomes that whether they receive um, the learning in the universities or like from experience, uh, they will be able to transfer as long as they have the same learning outcome. So uh, for us, the learning outcome will focus, I think, on the professional uh, competencies in our countries. So uh, as long as uh, you have the same learning outcome, those um, will be converted into the credits and store is in the credit bank system for, from each institution. This is like the whole model for right. our credit bank system, our Thai Mook credit bank system. Right. So I think we uh, have the same point of view as Malaysia that uh, you can either, you know, learning to receive the credit or can transfer from the experience. But the difference is that I think like Malaysia is kind of ahead of us that you already have the practices that how you convert those experience and you know the credits to accumulate into the credit bank system that yes, right. really interesting model mm -hmm. yeah and actually for this uh, budget year i hope that thai MOOC we will provide we will do the research to provide our like the curriculum credit bank system yeah pilot case yes. the pilot cases for that so to show yeah. with other mm -hmm. institutions how mm -hmm. um, you can you, you know as a pilot so we can see how how it's going yeah. to work because now we have the system right. we have the regulation we have announcement but we really don't have the really practices mm -hmm. one because this announcement just came out last year and our system is uh, try to modify, make it go in line with this announcement and regulation. Yeah, we also think about like the innovation of our MOOC courses, what is going. Yeah, yeah right. And actually, when we announce that Thai MOOC platform, we think about that we think about our innovation. So this year we gonna announce of the Thai Mook Academy. Thai Mook yeah. Academy, yeah. Just to change the name uh -huh. for like the max is like the effective. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, move toward the yeah. extension of Thai Mook. So Thai Mook Academy, the differentiate with um, Thai Mook platform, the original one is mm -hmm. we expand to the credit bank system. Right. We uh, try to find a way to authenticity that many, <laughs> you know, like other MOOC platform mm -hmm. also concerned about the authenticity of the certificate and everything. So And actually, we also collaborate with many organizations, right. not the private, but also for the, uh, like the official, like the government organization. Mm -hmm that mm -hmm. we also announced it at Thai MOOC Academy. Right, in order to um, make it more, um, to prove of authenticity, we also work with um, DGA, which shortened for the Digital Government Development um, Agency, whose um, uh, very, uh, whose expertise and responsible, responsible in the, um, the ID, the national ID, the, uh, and also we work with EDDA, is the Electronic Transaction Development Agency. So those agencies uh, will help us to prove of, you know, the authenticity, authenticity of the certification to be able to uh, keep it in the, um, the credit bank system. So those are the um, supervise us in terms of, you know, the, um, the, the move of Thai Mu to the Thai Mu Academy. So we partner with a lot of mm -hmm. the government agencies. So uh, for the roadmap and progress. Yeah, we have done already. We <laughs> okay. don't think of the past, we will think of the future. 
that yes. can collaborate with the ASEAN community plus Republic of Korea. <laughs> so these are the um, the roadmap and the progress. So uh, like what we mentioned earlier, we started since 2017. Uh, that time we developed the platform and start to create uh, develop the content. And then after that, we uh, we build a network with uh, various organization at both national and international level. And uh, in 2019, we telemed the the course the lifelong learning courses with um to to serve the lifelong learning concept so we uh tele uh we we try to develop many different type of course uh to serve the concept of lifelong learning and um in 2020 we providing MOOC platform not only to the university level but also we uh, give a service to government agencies and also the private and public organization um, last year and this year we um, like what we mentioned earlier we expand the system so we develop the accreditation system for online courses and credit bank and these are uh, Thai MOOC will not be this success without the cooperation with um, more than 120 uh, organizations like what we mentioned earlier. We have the university network throughout the country that really make this happen. And uh, with the RENA organization that they are very expertise, have their own expertise, and then they help us to develop the course, uh, not only for their staff development, but um, it going also benefit to our higher education learners as well. And actually, Ajahn, Ajahn Jin, actually for the nine higher education network, we also provide our Thai MOOC platform for them. Example, like some university, they didn't provide their own learning management system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We also uh, we also let them do like the micro site of our Thai MOOC platform. We mm -hmm. call their own university and then connect with the MOOC. Example mm -hmm. like uh, CMU, Chiang Mai University, mm -hmm. MOOC, something like that. Yeah. Because yeah. we believe yeah. that each organization need to be happy their mm -hmm. own identity so um, by providing support in terms right. of the back end mm -hmm. with the system but that can have own mm -hmm. uh, front end and, and we also provide this platform for all Thai some organization in mm -hmm. Thailand right also. who not re yep. ready to have their own system so they can use mm -hmm. us first as the pilot and then once they um, learning and grooming and then they can have their own for this year our big partner with the teacher council right. or the Thai teacher right. will be accessed from the Thai MOOC platform. And mm -hmm. um, self-learning yes. courses in order to receive the teaching certificate. Right. Right. Okay. So these are the our steps step, uh, from uh, since Thai MOOC started in 2016 until now. As you can see, like during the pandemic, like the director mentioned that it's really um, opened up our opportunity in terms of um, professors, learners start to learn uh, a lot from MOOC. Um, in 2019, we still have only 320,000 learners and until now it's like five times like 1.5 million and also the certification we also issue um, level one to certificate level one certificate level of completion 1.5 certificate um, mm -hmm. so uh, today actually we also invite the expert and who really pay a play a big role in helping us to decide uh, uh, the course development that uh, focus on competency-based curriculum. This is really one of our so proud pilot study that um, professor from Open University, Sukho Thai Tamatira, she also Ali, here yeah. uh, as our expert right. today. For the curriculum of uh, the elderly, elderly care checking. Yeah, uh, Professor Ali. 
ค่ะ So this project is um really interesting because uh we partner with uh different sectors. So first we partner with um Thaimook, uh provide a platform, and work together with um. Of course, s u k h o t a i t a m a t r a t Open University that have the um, elderly care curriculum or program, and then uh, to make it more um, benefit both for academic certificate and also the professional certificate, uh, we also partner with Thailand Professional Qualification Institutes to uh, access and certify learners in this program. And we also partner to expand uh, the opportunity for Thai learners. We also partner with community college institutes. With uh, they have a lot of student across the country. So this really open up their opportunity in both academic in that they can pursuing their bachelor degree in open university, and for their profession they can receive and certify receive the professional. Uh, qualification certificate, so they will be able to um, to work and to receive um, uh, to 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 work uh, certifiably, and yeah. So these are um, the our so proud pilot project mm -hmm. for to to really show that uh, from the content on MOOC platform, how can we really uh, make it into practice. And actually, a j a n t a i in this year we gonna start the next research and development to produce like the prototype model for in advance and actually for the educational technology curriculum for right. four university in Thailand. Yeah. We gonna set up from the like the competency mm -hmm. on each subject. Is curriculum, and then we gonna start with the prototype. How that we can learn for the first university, learn from the fourth, the third university, and keep their own credit in our credit bank system. Not only for the Thai Mu credit bank, but for own university credit bank, and come together in the future and get the degree in the future also. The four universities yeah. in a tech field, right. educational technology. Example like uh, uh, Chan Ton from Sinakarin v i r o Sinakarin v i r o t University, uh, Chan Kong, <laughs> Chan Sulapon from Uni Un Technology King Mongkut Technology University and from k a s e s a t University and s i l a p a k o n University for four university. Yeah. I hope that next year we gonna start the new mm -hmm. the prototype model for micro credential okay. project. And further uh, use for the uh, accumulate for the credit bank system right. as well. Right. So not only these two projects, uh, the elderly care program, the educational technology program, but we also partner with um, the office of the vocational education mm -hmm. commission. In this model, we looking for the pre-learning mm -hmm. uh, before they enter the university. So this can really open the opportunity for K-12 level, focusing on the vocational education one. So this one we signed MOU uh, beginning of last year, and uh, we continue working with them. Um, yeah, and this is Sin Professor um, uh, Dr. So is here. So we uh, <laughs> try to find yeah. like this memorable <laughs> history mm -hmm. of us that um, since 2017, that time we signed the uh, MOU with. J MOOC with the support of J MOOC, K MOOC, mm -hmm. and Thai MOOC, and um, and the wish from the uh, UNESCO, and then Li Bing is coming already for representative from oh. UNESCO. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we will continue our collaboration. Right. Yeah. So uh, started from that. Three partners, and now we expanding uh, with our partners, and we looking for more partners. Like uh, today, I think, like you know, after this session, we will uh, talking about the collaboration with. This other is not platforms. a partner. I can call friends. them the friend, family. 
more friends, more yeah. colleagues. Yeah. Friends. Okay. Um, these are some of the example of how we exchanging the content between our platform and other MOOC platforms. So um, some courses already provided in English, but some they are provided in their own language. So what we do is we add the subtitle to those courses uh, to help uh, the learners. For example, the very famous course is from KMOOC. Um, a bridge to the world Korean language for beginner one and two. These are two courses that are very, are very popular for our MOOC platform. Uh, in that course, uh, the audio are in English, and then we um, they already have the Korean and English subtitle, and then we add the Thai subtitle to help our Thai learners. So these are the examples that um, we have collaborated with other MOOC platform regarding the content exchanging. Chin, actually, let me call this one is one of the, our, our innovation of the Thai MOOC platform mm -hmm. because this is an innovation for the human network innovation <laughs> model that we have done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So not only we uh, import those courses, but we also export ours <laughs> because so to make it balance. So um, we found that uh, the courses that um, f uh, other MOOCs interested in ours is mm -hmm. uh, related to tourism and um, data science. Uh, also, one course is about the massage. Thai massage, as we all know, that is quite famous. And um, Northern Thai food and the causes related to the cultures, tourism and hospitalities. So. Because Dr. Su also mentioned that when, when, they mm -hmm. also in, when he also in charge of the KMOOC, he mm -hmm. also mentioned that how about Thai, Thailand can access for their own causes, example like hospitality and data science. Mm -hmm. they also, we also contact that university that provide that courses and exchange to the KMU. Mm -hmm. So these are some examples mm -hmm. that um, we can further talk about this later. Right. Um, for the sustainability model, we may look differently from others, but we learn from other presentations as well. Right. For the sustainability model uh, for Thai MOOC, we found that um, we would like to play an active role in terms of the uh, being the references or the uh, to give the inference to others. So we not only provide content courses or the platform, but we also have the um, the session like webinar session uh, to talking about you know our MOOC contents and how to implement it in different contexts. That, that what we feel that this will make us sustainability. And especially during um, the pandemic COVID-19, uh, many universities uh, try to find the uh, online content to use for their courses. So we found that this is a challenge and many university ask us or consult us how can they uh, implement their online courses or make the evaluation or those kind of things. So we start to have the webinar live and also the on-demand one. Uh, we have Taimook Talk, Taimook Talk Return, and we have Taimook Talk on tour. And actually, um, the the team who help us with this is um, Michael. He's he is very popular. Um, <laughs> the host, the show host that, you know, like everyone, uh, I think we, we online every Thursday, right, Michael? Yeah, yeah so everyone looking Thursday forward to, to meeting with him and, you know, like his guests on that night. And we have supporting team, the back of this room on the left. Like those are our supporting team as well. Ajahn, Dr. Nuan, and Dr. Bot, the team support. They are the supporting team for our Thai MOOC talk. Um, we also uh, have the media on not only the live podcast, webinar, or the on demand one, but we also do the podcast. Uh, so we try to 
make the active role in you know like getting people to to know our platform and make the best use of it. So we just find a way, not only the video but the podcast one. And every year, uh, I just talking to um, the the professor from Malaysia, N- Nabura, and she mentioned that oh yeah, I remember now. Like she came to our conference ten right. years ago. <laughs> yeah, so it's been I think like more than ten times that we have the international conference every year, and. Um, Yeah, during the past year, I think we did online during the COVID pandemic, and just um, last year we did in the three modes of but uh of uh, uh for participant to choose whether they can uh attend online, on site, and onwards, and again the expert uh in help us do the time movers is also in this room, นะคะ uh Dr. s u l a p o n นะคะ she he is the expert for our time move team in doing this for us, ค่ะ so he's right there, ค่ะ so he's the designer for time movers and everything, ค่ะ okay so those uh conclude all our yeah. presentation, ค่ะ let me summarize all our our project the time move platform that we have done for three The category. The first one is we do the methodology. Everything that we have done for the Thai MOOC platform. The other, the second is we have done for the uh, like the IT, the information technology, and the system of the platform. We gonna uh, turn to be turn up to to be like the uh, Thai MOOC Academy. In, In the near future, and the last one we have done for our human network. Yeah, we call that M I H. Okay. Or three category. Yeah, and yeah. I would say like Time Move will not be this mm-hmm. success without the support yeah. from all the experts in this room today. That's why we yeah. invite you all here today to yeah. to share this success. Right. Yeah. And actually, after next section, I would like to invite all of you come together with sharing the idea, the discussion. Mm-hmm. How do we collaborate for make our future of education <laughs> possible? <laughs> okay, ka. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, much for your attention. Thank you so much, Mademoiselle Director and Madam Vice President, uh, Vice Director. <laughs> It's been a long session, but I hope you enjoy listening to the history of Thai MOOC. Um, any questions or comments on the, from the floor, please? Okay, uh, Madam Chancellor, please. Microphone, please. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I actually I have a long list of questions, but. Uh, I'm, I'm interested with this uh, Thai MOOC Academy, uh, which you are planning to do in the future. Uh, will it be a degree granting uh, unit, just like any conventional university, making use of the credits earned through MOOC? Is, is that the direction for the Thai MOOC Academy? For the university, right? But uh, uh, deg- uh, uh, will it grant degree? Uh, To um, to individuals who have earned so, like for instance, uh, you have the credit banking system already. So uh, the MOOC learners are now earning credits, right? And they are um, stacking it. Okay. So uh, is the plan for the Thai MOOC Academy? Um, will you be granting degrees, making use of the credits earned through MOOC? If that university they open that courses mm-hmm. under our platform. Yeah. Yeah. Because our uh, our uh, platform that they provide for the like the self-paced learning, okay. some university they also ask us, is it possible to open for that, especially for the spark like the private, uh, okay. small private mm-hmm. open yeah. courses. Okay. If they open that way, they can get the degree from the university, but we are the pat our platform. Yeah. Right. So right. The, platform. the degree Example. will be conferred by the university, not yeah. not from Thai MOOC Academy, yeah. not not yeah. from. We never compete with universities. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but we we work together but and cooperate, the yes. co- facilitate the universities. 
Yes, I, uh, in connection <laughs> to your uh, <laughs> Professor Mandela's questions, uh, anyway, in the future, maybe uh, in five or ten, ten years mm -hmm. later, uh, somebody has to issue the statements of degree. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to prepare mm -hmm. for, like, if, if I uh, finish, like, uh, if, if I reach uh, 120 credits, yeah. so, like, 70% 70, 70 of my credits from, like, Cholarongkon, uh -huh. maybe the chair of Cholarongkon will give mm -hmm. me the degree. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. the Ministry of yeah. Higher Education or Ministry of Education mm -hmm. give a word, the mm -hmm. degree. Mm -hmm. I think you need to prepare. Yeah. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the learners, mm -hmm. they can be confused right. in the near future. Right. Because the Thai Academy means, it means you process everything and then issue yeah. a word, right. degree, or yeah. license. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to prepare. Mm -hmm. Okay, you thank, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Su. Actually, for the permanent secretary, the, uh, the Ministry of Higher Education, they also uh, asked the Thai MOOC platform to open some courses for the professional development for our staff to train via that platform. And they also ask that is it, co is it possible to continue to the university, mm -hmm. some subject or something like that. We hope that some of our staff in the near future can get a degree from that university. We have to sign like the back side, the back office to mm -hmm. do this thing possible. Thank you for the comment. This is a big issue. Yeah. We have yeah, to do right. for the human network again. Thank you. Okay, any more comments or Ajahn Pongchawat, anything yes, you'd like to add on? Okay, if not, I think it is time we would call our live session a day, but mm -hmm. we are not done yet. We are going to take a 15 minute break. After that, we will rearrange this room. It will be an um, expert meeting. You are invited to contribute your ideas on how we are going to make our lifelong learning for our region better. So please um, enjoy your break. Ah, before that, I recommend you to um, <laughs> pack up your things because they need to rearrange your room. It will be like a square shape, discussion uh, set up. So please uh, make sure that you gather your belongings, uh, leave it maybe um, on the side, and then 15 minutes, come back for the expert meeting. For the expert meeting, won't be a live session. It will be private, just between us. So secret is kept in this room. So on behalf of Thailand Cyber University Project, we thank you, all of us, all of you who join us online. Um, if you miss any part, of course, you can watch as a video on demand from the same link anytime. Link to download slides have been added, so you can download any slides, any sessions right now. So on behalf of Thailand Cyber University Project, once again, we thank you, you and see you next time. Thank you. Oh, nobody present them with a token of appreciation.